page 417. Maybe Giller is waiting and hoping someone will come so he can help them get away with the box. Then again, maybe he will not be so willing to part company with it. But we won't know if we never make it to him now, will we? He addressed Zed. You told me the box has magic, and a wizard or Rahl can feel that magic. But a wizard can also cover the feeling of that magic with a wizard's web so the box can't be detected. That could be why Queen Melena wanted a wizard, to hide the box from Rawl and use it as a bargaining tool. If we create a big commotion and scare Giller, no matter how he feels about us, he may be frightened and use the opportunity to escape. It could also be that Rahl is just waiting for the quarry to be flushed from cover, and then he will pounce. Zed turned to Kalen. I think the Seeker has some good points. Perhaps we should hear him out. Kalen smiled a little. I believe you are correct, good wizard. She turned to Richard. What is your way? You've dealt with this Queen Melena before, right? What sort of person is she? Kalen needed no time to give it any thought. Tamarang is a minor and relatively insignificant land. Still, Queen Melena is as pompous and arrogant as any queen comes. A small snake, but a snake that can kill us nonetheless, Richard noted. Kalen nodded. But a snake with a big head. Small snakes have to be careful, cautious, when they don't know what they are up against. The first thing we have to do is to give her a worry, make her unsure enough not to bite us. What do you mean? Kalen asked. You said you've dealt with her before. Confessors go to the lands to take confessions and to inspect the prisons to find out what they will. She wouldn't want to close Tamarang to a confessor, would she? Not if she has half a brain, Zed chuckled. Well, that's what we do then. You put your dress back on and do your duty. Simply a confessor doing what confessors are expected to do. She may not like it, but she will treat you well. She will want you to be happy. She will want you to see what you will and then be on your way. The last thing she will want is to raise a fuss. So you inspect her dungeon, smile or frown or whatever it is you do, and then before we're on our way, you say you want to speak to your former wizard. You think she should go alone? Zed protested. No. Kaelin doesn't have a wizard with her. The queen would see that as a tempting vulnerability. We don't want her mouth to water. Zed folded his arms. I will be her wizard. No, you will not be her wizard. Dark and Rahl is killing people as we speak, looking for you. If you remove the wizard's web, let them know who you are. We'll have trouble down around our ears before we can get away with the box. Who knows what reward there is on your wrinkled hide. You will be her protection, but you will be anonymous protection. You will be... Richard tapped the sword hilt, thinking. His eyes came back down. You will be a cloud reader, a trusted advisor to the Mother Confessor in the absence of a wizard. Richard frowned slightly at Zed's grumble. I'm sure you know how to play the part. Then you will hide your sword, your identity from her as well? Kalen asked. No. The presence of the Seeker will give her pause, something else to worry about, something to keep her fangs in her mouth until we're away. The whole point is to give her something she's familiar with a confessor, so as not to raise an alarm. At the same time, give her something to keep her worried, a cloud reader and the seeker, so she would rather be rid of us than find out what sort of trouble we might be able to cause. The way you two want to do it gets us in a fight, a fight where one or all of us could be hurt. My way puts us at minimum risk of a fight, and if it comes, at least it will be when we're on our way out with the box. He gave each of them a stern look. You do remember the box, don't you? In case you've forgotten, that is what we're after, not Giller's head in a basket. Whose side he's on is not an issue. We must only get the box, no more. Kalen folded her arms with a frown. Zed rubbed his chin while he looked into the fire. Richard let them mull it over for a while. He knew that the way they wanted to do it was sure to cause trouble, and that soon enough they would both realize it. Zed turned back to him. Of course you are right, I agree. His thin face turned to Kalen. Mother Confessor? She studied Zed's face a moment before looking up at Richard. Agreed. But Richard, the two of you will have to play the part of courtiers to the Mother Confessor. Zed knows the protocol, but you don't. I hope not to be there long. Just tell me what I need to know to get by for a short time. Kalen drew a deep breath. 
Well, I guess the most important thing is to look like you are part of my escort. Be respectful. She cleared her throat, diverting her eyes. Just pretend like I am the most important person you have ever been around and treat me in that manner and no one will question. Every confessor allows her attendants different liberties, and as long as you are deferential, no one will think anything of it if you should happen to do something not quite proper. Even if you think my behavior odd, just play along, all right? Richard watched her a moment while she studied the ground. He rose to his feet. It would be my honor, Mother Confessor. He gave a bow. Zed cleared his throat. A little deeper, my boy. You are not traveling with a mere confessor. You are an escort to the Mother Confessor herself. All right, Richard sighed. I'll do my best. Now get some sleep. I'll take first watch. He started walking toward the trees. Richard! Zed called after him. He stopped, turning back. There are many in the Midlands who have magic. Many different and dangerous types of magic. There is no telling what manner of sycophants Queen Milena has surrounded herself with. You pay attention to what Kaelin and I tell you and do your best not to cross anyone. You may not know who or what her attendants are. Richard drew his cloak around himself. In and out with minimum fuss. That's what I want, too. If all goes well, tomorrow at this time we will have the box, and our only worry will be to find a hole to hide in until winter. Good. You have it right, my boy. Good night. In a spot thin of brush, Richard found a moss-covered log to sit on while he kept an eye toward the camp and the surrounding woods. He checked to make sure the moss was dry. He didn't want to sit in damp moss and then have wet pants to make him colder. The moss was dry, so he rearranged his sword, sat down, and wrapped his cloak tight. Clouds hid the moon. If it wasn't for the fire lending the little illumination it did to the surrounding woods, it would be the kind of dark that made you think you were blind. Richard sat and brooded. He didn't like the idea of Kaylin having to put on the dress and put herself at risk. He liked it less that it was his own idea. He wondered and worried at what she meant about her acting odd and his playing along. He wondered and worried even more at what she had said about pretending she was the most important person he had ever been around. He liked that not at all. He always pictured Kalen in his mind as his friend at the least. He didn't like to picture her as the mother confessor. It was confessor's magic that made it impossible for them to be more than friends. He was afraid to see her as others saw her, as the mother confessor. Any reminder of what she was, her magic, only brought the hurt deeper into his heart. It was the smallest of sounds that made him sit bolt upright. The eyes were on him. They were close, and though he couldn't see them, he could feel them. The knowledge that something was close watching him sent a chill across his skin. It made him feel naked, vulnerable. His eyes were wide, his heart pounding as he looked straight ahead to where he knew the thing was. The silence, except for his heart beating in his ears, was oppressive. Richard held his breath, trying to hear. Again came the soft sound of a foot being lowered stealthily to the forest floor. It was coming toward him. Richard's wide eyes stared frantically into the blackness, trying to see a movement. It was no more than ten paces away when the yellow eyes inched into view, hunkered low to the ground. The eyes were glowering right at him. The thing stopped. He held his breath. With a howl, it sprang. Richard jumped to his feet, his hand going for the sword. When it bounded into the air, Richard saw that it was a wolf, the biggest wolf he had ever seen. It was to him before his hand even reached the hilt. The wolf's front paws hit his chest square. The powerful impact drove him backward over the log he had been sitting on. As he fell backward, his breath knocked from him. He saw behind him something more frightening than the wolf, a heart hound. The huge jaws snapped at his chest just as the wolf reached the heart hound and went for its throat. Richard's head hit something hard. He heard a yelp and the sound of teeth ripping tendon. Everything went black. His eyes opened. Zed was looking down at him and had a middle finger to each side of Richard's forehead. Kalin was holding a torch. He felt dizzy but stood anyway on wobbly legs until Kalin made him sit on the log. With a frown of concern, she stroked her fingers on his face. Are you all right? I think so, he managed. My head, it hurts. He thought he might throw up. Zed took the torch from Kalin and held it behind the log. 
casting light on the body of a heart hound, its throat ripped out. Zed looked down at Richard's sword, still in its sheath. How is it the hound didn't have you? Richard felt the back of his head. It hurt like daggers twisting. I don't know. It all happened so fast. Then he remembered like a dream when waking. He stood up again. A wolf. It was a wolf that has been following us. Kalin stepped closer, put an arm around his waist to steady him. A wolf? The odd tone of suspicion in her voice made him look to her narrowed eyes. Are you sure? Richard nodded. I was sitting here, and then all of a sudden I knew it was watching me. It came closer, and I saw its yellow eyes. Then it leapt at me. I thought it was attacking. It knocked me flat right over the log. I never even had time to draw the sword. It was so fast, but it wasn't attacking me. It was going for the heart hound behind me, protecting me. I never even saw the heart hound until I was falling backward. It must have killed the hound. That wolf saved my life. Kaylin straightened herself and put her fists on her hips. Brophy, she called into the darkness. Brophy, I know you're out there. Come here this instant. The wolf trotted into the torchlight with its head down and its tail between its legs. Its thick fur was a charcoal color from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail. Fierce yellow eyes glowed from its dark head. The wolf dropped to its belly and crawled to Kalin's feet. Once there, it rolled onto its back with paws in the air and whined. Brophy, she admonished. Have you been following us? Only to protect you, mistress. Richard's jaw dropped. He wondered how hard he had been hit on the head. He can talk. I heard him. That wolf can talk. Zed and Kalin both looked up at his wide eyes. Zed glanced at her. I thought you said you told him. Kalin winced a little. Well, I guess I didn't remember to tell him everything. She frowned at Zed. It's hard to remember everything he doesn't know. We have lived it our whole lives. You just forget he hasn't. Come on, Zed grumbled. Let's go back to the camp, all of us. The wizard led them with the torch, Kalin following, the wolf slinking along at her side, ears lowered, tail dragging the ground. When they sat around the fire, Richard addressed the wolf as it sat on its haunches next to Kalin. Wolf, I guess? Brophy. The name's Brophy. Richard sat back a little. Brophy, sorry. My name is Richard, and this is Zed. Brophy, I would like to thank you for saving my life. Don't mention it, he growled. Brophy, Kalin said in a disapproving voice. What are you doing here? The wolf's ears flattened. There is danger for you. I have been protecting you. You have been released, she scolded. Was that you last night? Richard asked. Brophy regarded him with yellow eyes. Yes. Whenever you camped, I cleared the area of heart hounds and a few other nasty things. Last night, close to morning, one came near to your camp. I took care of it. This hound tonight was hunting you. He could hear your heart beating. I knew Mistress Kalin would be unhappy if he ate you, so I kept him from doing it. Richard swallowed hard. Thank you, he said in a weak voice. Richard, Zed asked, rubbing his chin. The hounds are underworld beasts. They haven't bothered you up until now. What's changed? Richard almost choked. Well, Addie gave Kalin a bone to carry to get us through the boundary and to protect us from underworld beasts. I had an old bone that my father gave me, and Addie said it would do the same thing. But I lost it a day or two ago. Zed's face was wrinkled up in thought. Richard looked to the wolf, hoping to change the subject. How come you can talk? Brophy drew his long tongue around his lips. Same reason you can talk. I can talk because... He looked up at Kalin. You mean he doesn't know what I am? She gave him a look, and he sank to the ground, resting his head on his paws. Kalin locked her fingers around a knee, clicking her thumbnails together. Richard, do you remember when I told you that sometimes when we took a confession, the person turned out to be innocent? And once in a great while, one who was to be executed would ask to give a confession so as to prove his innocence? Richard nodded. She cast an eye to the wolf. Brophy was to be executed for killing a little boy. I don't kill children, the wolf growled, coming to his feet. Do you wish to tell the story? The wolf sank back down. No, mistress. Brophy would have rather been touched by a confessor's power than be thought a child killer. 
not to mention what else was done to that little boy. He requested a confessor. It's something done only rarely. Most men choose the executioner, but it meant that much to him. I told you we have a wizard with us when we take confessions. One reason is for protection, but there is another reason. In a case like this, where the person is unjustly accused and found to be innocent, he is still left touched by our power. He cannot be returned to who he was. So the wizard changes him to something else. The changing takes away some of the magic of the confessor and gives him enough concern for himself to start over with a new life. Richard was incredulous. You were innocent, and yet you are to be left like this for life? Completely innocent, Brophy confirmed. Brophy? Kalin spoke his name in a rising tone Richard was familiar with. The wolf sank back down. Of killing that boy. His cowering eyes looked up at Kaylin as she watched him. That's all I meant, innocent of killing that boy. Richard frowned. What does that mean? Kaylin looked over to him. It means that when he gave his confession, he confessed to other things he was not accused of. You see, Brophy had been engaged in occupations of a dubious nature. She glanced down at the wolf. At the gray edges of law. I was an honest businessman, the wolf protested. Kalen cast an eye toward Brophy while she spoke to Richard. Brophy was a traitor. My father was a traitor, Richard said, his anger rising. I don't know what traders in Westland trade, but in the Midlands, some traders deal in things of magic. Richard thought about the Book of Counted Shadows. So what? Kalen lifted an eyebrow to him. Some of them happened to be alive at the time. Brophy rose up to his front paws. How am I to tell? You can't always tell. Sometimes you think something is just an artifact, like a book that a collector will pay handsomely for. Sometimes it's something more. A stone, a statue, or a staff. Or perhaps, uh... Well, how am I to know if they are alive? Kaylin still had her eye on the wolf. You traded things of magic other than books and statues, she scolded. In this innocent business of his, he would also get himself into disagreements with people. Disagreements such as rights of ownership... When Brophy was a man, he was as big for a man as he is for a wolf. He sometimes used his size to persuade people to do as he wished. Is this not true, Brophy? The wolf's ears wilted. It's true, mistress. I have a temper. A temper as big as my muscles. But it only came out when I was wronged. A lot of people think they can cheat traitors... They think we are little more than thieves and will not stand up for ourselves. When I settled disagreements with my temper, they tended to stay settled. Kalen gave the wolf a little smile. Brophy had a reputation that, although not unearned, was larger than the truth. She looked up at Richard. The business he was in was dangerous and therefore very profitable. Brophy made enough money at it to support his hobby. Almost no one knew about it until after I touched him and he made his confession. The wolf put his paws over his head. Oh, mistress, please, must we? Richard frowned. What was this hobby? Kalen's smile widened. Brophy had a weakness, children. As he traveled around in search of things to trade, he would stop at orphanages and see to it they had what they needed to take care of the children. All the gold he made ended up in different orphanages so the children could be cared for and not go hungry. He twisted the arms of the people running the orphanages to swear them to secrecy. He didn't want anyone knowing. Of course, he didn't have to twist very hard. Brophy's paws were still over his head, and his eyes squeezed tightly shut. Mistress, please, he whined. I have a reputation. He opened his eyes and rose up on his front paws. And a well-earned one at that. I have broken my share of arms and noses. I've done some pretty despicable deeds. Kalen lifted an eyebrow to him. Yes, you have. Some were reason enough to get you thrown in prison for a time. But none were reason enough to chop off your head. She looked back up at Richard. You see, since Brophy had been seen around orphanages and because of his reputation, no one was too surprised when he was accused of the murder of a little boy. Demon Nass, Brophy growled. Accused by Demon Nass. His lips curled back, showing his long teeth as he growled. Why didn't the people at the orphanages stand up for you? Demonass, Brophy growled again. He would have slit their throats. 
Who is this Demon Nass? Kalin exchanged a look with the wolf. Remember when Dark and Rall came to the mud people and he took Sidon? Remember when he said Sidon was a gift for a friend? Demon Nass is that friend. She gave Richard a meaningful look. Demon Nass has a very sick interest in little boys. Richard felt a stab of fear and pain for Sidon and for Savadlin and Wesselon. He remembered his promise to try to find their boy. He had never felt so powerless. If I ever find him, Brophy growled fiercely, I will settle a few scores. He's not fit to die. He must pay first for the things he's done. You just stay away from him, Kalin warned. He is a dangerous man. I don't want you hurt any more than you have been already. The wolf's yellow eyes flared angrily at Kalin for a moment before they cooled. Yes, mistress. He lay back down. I would have faced the executioner with my head held high. The spirits know I may have earned it, but not for that. I would not let them kill me thinking I had done those things to children. So I demanded a confessor. I didn't want to take his confession. Kalin picked up a stick and pushed at the dirt. I knew he wouldn't have requested a confessor unless he was innocent. I talked to the judge. He said that in view of the crime, he would not commute the sentence. It was death or a confession. Brophy insisted upon the confession. Richard could see the firelight reflecting in the wetness of her green eyes. Afterward, I asked him to pick another creature he would choose to be if he had a choice. He chose a wolf. Why a wolf, I don't know. She smiled a little. I guess it fits his nature. Because wolves are honorable creatures, Richard smiled. You haven't lived in the forest. You've lived among people. Wolves are very social creatures, have strong ties and relationships. They are fiercely protective of their young. The whole pack will fight to protect them. And all members of the pack care for the young. You understand, Brophy whispered. Really, Brophy? she asked. Yes, mistress, I have a good life now. His tail swished back and forth. I have a mate. She's a fine wolf. She smells divine, and her nips give me shivers, and she has the cutest little... Well, never mind. He looked up at Kalin. She is the leader of our pack, with me at her side, of course. She is pleased with me. She says I'm the strongest wolf she has ever seen. We had a litter this last spring, six. They're fine pups, almost grown now. It's a fine life, hard, but fine. Thank you, mistress, for releasing me. I'm so glad, Brophy. But why are you here? Why aren't you back with your family? Well, when you were coming down out of the Rang Shada, you passed near my den. I sensed your presence. I found I could smell you. The urge to protect you was too strong to overcome. I know you are in danger, and I can't be at peace in my pack until I know you're safe. I must protect you. Brophy, she protested, we're fighting to stop Dark and Rawl. It's too dangerous for you to be with us. I don't want you to lose your life. You have already sacrificed too much to Dark and Rawl through Dem and Nas. Mistress, when I was changed to the wolf, it removed most of my need for you, my need to please you. Yet I would still die for you. It is still extremely difficult for me to go against your wishes, but in this I must. I will not leave you to danger. I must protect you, or I could never be at peace. Command me to leave if you will, but I will not go. I will shadow you until you are safe from Dark and Rahl. Brophy, Richard said. The wolf looked over to him. I too want Kaelin protected, so she can do her job and help stop Rahl. I would be honored to have you along. You have already proven your value and your heart. If you can help protect her, you just ignore what she says and go right on protecting her. Brophy looked up at her. Kalin smiled at him. He is the seeker. I'm sworn on my life to protect him as is Zed. If that is his word, then I must go along. Brophy's muzzle opened in surprise. He commands you? He commands the mother confessor? He does. The wolf studied him in a new light, shook his head. Wonder of wonders. He licked his lips. By the way, I would like to thank you for the food you have left me. Kalin frowned. What are you talking about? Whenever he trapped food, he always left some for me. You did? she asked. 
Richard shrugged. Well, I knew he was out there, and I didn't know what he was, but I didn't think he meant us harm. So I left him food to let him know we didn't mean him any harm either. He smiled at the wolf. But when you came at me back there, I surely thought I had made a mistake. Thank you again. Brophy seemed uncomfortable with the gratitude and stood. I have been here long enough. I have woods to patrol. There might be things about. The three of you need not stand watch with Brophy on the job. Richard pushed a stick at the fire, watching the spark swirl into the air. Brophy, what was it like when Kaylin touched you, when she released her power into you? No one spoke. Richard looked into the wolf's yellow eyes. Brophy's head turned to Kaylin. Tell him, she whispered in a broken voice. Brophy lay back down, folding one paw over the other, his head held high. He was silent for a long time before he spoke. It's hard to remember everything at that time, but I will try to explain it the best I can. His head cocked a little to one side. Pain. I remember the pain. It was exquisite, beyond anything you could imagine. The first thing I remember after the pain is fear. Overpowering fear I might be breathing wrong and it would somehow displease her. I almost died from fear that I would displease her. And then when she told me what she wanted to know, it was a flush of the greatest joy I had ever known. Joy, because then I knew what I could do to please her. I was overjoyed that she had made a request of me, that there was something I could do to satisfy her. That's what I remember the most. The desperate, frantic need to do as she wanted, to satisfy her and make her happy. Nothing else was in my mind, only to please her, to be in her presence was beyond bliss. The pleasure of being in her presence made me cry with elation. She told me to tell the truth, and I was so happy because I knew I could do that. I was thrilled to have a task within my power. I started talking as fast as I could to tell her all the truth I could. She had to tell me to slow down because she couldn't understand me. If I had had a knife, I would have used it on myself for displeasing her. Then she told me it was all right, and I cried because she was not displeased with me. I told her what happened. His ears wilted a little. After I told her I hadn't killed the boy, I remember she put her hand on my arm. The touch nearly made me faint with pleasure. And she said she was sorry. I misunderstood. I thought she meant she was sorry I hadn't killed the boy. I begged her to let me go kill another boy for her. Tears ran from the corners of the wolf's eyes. Then she explained that what she meant was that she was sorry for me for being wrongly accused of the murder. I remember crying uncontrollably because she had shown me a kindness. She was sorry for me. She cared for me. I remember what it felt like to be near her, to be in her presence. I guess it was a feeling of love, but words are so hollow next to the power of the wanting of her. Richard stood. He could only make himself take the briefest of glances at Kaylin at her tears. Thank you, Brophy. He had to pause a moment to make sure his voice wouldn't fail him. It's late. We'd better get some sleep. Tomorrow is an important day. I'm going to take my watch. Good night. Brophy stood. You three sleep. I will stand watch tonight. Richard swallowed the lump. I appreciate that, but I will stand my watch. If you wish, you may guard my back. He turned and started to leave. Richard! Zed called out to him. Richard stopped without turning. What bone is it that your father gave you? Richard's mind raced in a panic. Please, Zed, he said to himself, if you have ever believed a lie I have told you, believe this one. You remember it. It was that little round one. You've seen it before. I know you have. Oh. Yes, I guess I must have. Good night. Wizard's first rule. Thank you, my old friend, he thought to himself, for teaching me how to protect Kalen's life. He walked on into the night, his head pounding with pain, from without and from within. Chapter 39 The city of Tamarang couldn't hold all the people who wanted in. There were simply too many. People coming from every direction, seeking protection and safety, had overflowed to the countryside around the established quarters. Tents and shacks had sprung up on the bare ground outside the city walls, and out onto the hills. 
In the morning, people had flowed down from the hills into the impromptu market quarter outside the walls. People who had come from other towns, villages, and cities lined up in streets laid out in haphazard fashion at makeshift stands, selling whatever they had. Vendors sold everything from old clothes to fine jewelry. Fruits and vegetables were stacked at other stands. There were barbers and healers and fortune tellers, people who had paper and wanted to draw your face, and people who had leeches and wanted to draw your blood. Wine and spirits were for sale everywhere. Despite the circumstances of their presence, the people seemed in a festive mood. The imagined protection and ample supply of drink, Richard suspected. Talk floated freely of the wonders of Father Rall. Speakers stood at the center of small knots of citizens, telling the latest news, the latest atrocities. The tattered folk moaned and wailed at the outrages done by the Westlanders. There were cries for vengeance. Richard didn't see a single woman with hair past her jawline. The castle proper sat at the top of a high hill within its own walls, within the walls of the city. Red banners with a black wolf's head flew at evenly spaced intervals around the formidable castle walls. The huge wooden doors at the outer city walls stood closed to keep the riffraff at bay, it appeared. Patrols of soldiers prowled the streets on horseback, their armor glinting in the noonday sun, specks of light in an ocean of noisy people. Richard saw one detachment, red banners with black wolf's head flying over them as they swept through the new streets. Some people cheered, some bowed, but all backed away as the horses passed. The soldiers ignored them as if they didn't exist. People who didn't move out of the way quick enough got a boot to the head. But none of the people moved out of the way of the soldiers the way they moved out of the way for Kalin. People backed away from the mother confessor the way a pack of dogs backs away from a porcupine. Her white dress shone in the bright sun. Back straight, head held high, she walked as if she owned the whole city. She kept her eyes straight ahead and acknowledged no one. She had refused to wear her cloak, saying it wouldn't be proper, and that she wanted there to be no doubt as to who she was. There was no doubt. People fell over each other getting out of her way. Everyone bowed in a wave in the wide circle around her as she passed. Hushed whispers carried Kalin's title back through the throng. Kalin didn't acknowledge the bows. Zed, wearing Kalin's pack for her, walked at Richard's side, two paces behind her. Both his and Richard's eyes swept the crowds. In all the time he had known Zed, Richard had never seen him wear a pack. To say it looked odd would be an understatement. Richard kept his cloak hooked back behind the Sword of Truth. It raised a few eyebrows, but nothing like the Mother Confessor did. Is it like this everywhere she goes? Richard whispered to Zed. I'm afraid so, my boy. Without hesitation, Kalin walked smoothly over the massive stone bridge to the city gates. Guards at the near end of the bridge fell back out of her way. She ignored them. Richard surveyed everything in case he needed to find a fast way out. The two dozen guards at the city gates were obviously under instruction to allow no one to enter. The guards who had been standing at attention looked nervously at each other. They hadn't expected a visit from the mother confessor. With a clank of metal against metal, some of them moved back, bumping into each other, and some didn't, not knowing what to do. Kalin stopped. She stared ahead at the gates as if she expected them to evaporate out of her way. The guards in front of her pressed their backs against the gates as they looked sideways to their captain. Zed stepped around Kalin, turned to her, bowed deeply, as if to excuse himself for stepping in front of her, then turned to the captain. What's the matter with you? Are you blind, man? Open the gates! The captain's dark eyes shifted between Kalin and Zed. I'm sorry, but no one is to enter. And your name is? Zed's face turned bright red. Richard had to work at keeping his own face straight. The wizard's voice was a low hiss. Are you telling me, Captain, that you were told if the mother confessor comes by, don't let her in? The captain's eyes looked less sure. Well, I was ordered... I'm not... Open the gates right now! Zed bellowed, fists at his side. And get a proper escort here this instant! The captain almost jumped out of his armor. He yelled orders and men started running at his direction. The gates swung inward. Horses thundered up from behind and came around the little company, forming a rank in front of Kalin with their banners at the lead. More horsemen formed up behind. Foot soldiers came at a run, falling in beside her, but not too close. 
Richard was seeing her world for the first time, the loneliness of it. What had his heart gotten him into? With cold pain, he understood her need for a friend. You call this a proper escort, Zed roared. Well, it will have to do. He turned to Kalin, bowed deeply. My apologies, Mother Confessor, for this man's insolence and his feeble effort at an escort. Her eyes went to Zed, and she gave a slight bow of her head. Though he knew he had no right, the shape of her in that dress was making Richard sweat. As best they could, the men in the ranks kept a wary eye to Kalin, waiting, and when she started forward, they stepped in with her. Dust rose around the horses as they started through the gates. Zed fell in next to Richard as the procession started moving, leaning toward the captain as he passed. Count your blessings, the mother confessor doesn't know your name, captain, he snapped. Richard saw the captain sag with relief when they moved well past him. Richard smiled to himself. He had wanted to give them a worry, but he had no idea it would be so effective a worry. There was as much order to the city inside the walls as there was disorder outside its gates. Shops with their wares displayed in windows lined the paved streets, radiating out from the fortress castle. The streets lacked the dust and smells of those outside. There were inns that looked to be finer than any Richard had ever seen before, much less stayed in. Some had doormen standing at attention in red uniforms and white gloves. Elaborately carved signs hung above the doors. The Silver Garden Inn, the Collins Inn, the White Stallion, and the Carriage House. Men in fine, richly colored coats, escorting ladies in elaborate dresses, went about their business with calm grace. One thing that wasn't different about the people inside the walls was that they, too, bowed deeply when they saw the Mother Confessor approaching. As the sound of the horse's hooves on the stone and armor clanking drew their attention and they saw Kalin, they backed away and bowed, although not as quickly. There was no snap in their deference, no sincerity in their submission. There was a wisp of contempt in their eyes. Kalin ignored them. The people inside the walls also noticed the sword more than those outside had noticed it. Richard saw the men's eyes glide over it as he passed, saw the women's cheeks color with disdain. Women's hair was still short, but occasionally there was some that touched the shoulders, none longer. That, too, made Kaylin stand out all the more the way her hair cascaded off her shoulders and partway down her back. There was no woman with hair that even approached it. Richard was glad he hadn't cut it for her. One of the horsemen was given orders, and he broke rank in a dead run toward the castle to announce the arrival of the Mother Confessor. As she proceeded, Kalin wore the calm expression that showed nothing, an expression he was used to seeing on her. He now realized what it was. It was the expression worn by a confessor. Before they reached the castle gates, trumpets announced the arrival of the Mother Confessor. The tops of the walls were alive with soldiers, lancers, bowmen, and swordsmen. All stood in ranks, bowed as one when Kalin was close enough, and stayed bowed until she passed through the iron gates that stood open for her. Inside the gates, soldiers standing at attention lined each side of the road and bowed in unison as she passed. Some of the terraces held stone urns that marched off to either side, some of them still holding greenery, or flowers that must have been brought out daily from greenhouses. Broad, flat areas displayed hedges trimmed in intricate patterns, even mazes. Closer to the castle walls, hedges were larger, cut to mimic objects or animals. They extended off to the sides as far as the eye could see. The walls of the castle soared into the air above them. The complicated stonework left Richard awestruck. He had never been this close to anything man-made that was this huge. Shota's palace was big, but not this big, and he had never gotten close to it. Towers and turrets, walls and ramps, balconies and niches all rose high into the air above them. He marveled at what Kalin had told him, that this was an insignificant kingdom, and wondered at what the castles in the more important lands must be like. The horsemen had left them at the rampart, and as they were swallowed into the castle, the foot soldiers, six abreast with room for another six to each side, marched through the enormous pair of brass-clad doors and fanned out to the sides, leaving the three to walk on, Kalin in the lead. The room was immense. A gleaming sea of black and white marble tiles swept away ahead of them. 
polished stone columns, so large it would take ten people holding hands to reach around each and fluted with spiraling carved roping, rose in a line to both sides of the room, supporting row upon row of arches at the edge of the ribbed vaulted center ceiling. Richard felt as little as a bug. Huge tapestries depicting heroic scenes of vast battles hung on the side walls. He had seen tapestries before. His brother had too. Richard rather favored them and had always thought they were a grand extravagance. But Michael's tapestries were to these as a stick drawing in the dirt was to a fine oil painting. Richard hadn't even known such majestic things as these existed. Zed leaned a little closer to him and whispered, Put your eyes back in your head and shut your mouth. Chagrined, Richard snapped his mouth closed and put his eyes to the front. He leaned close to Zed and asked in a low whisper, Is this the kind of place she is used to? No, the mother confessor is used to much better than this. Overwhelmed, Richard straightened himself. Ahead lay a grand stairway. By Richard's estimation, his entire house would fit with room to spare on its central landing. Carved marble railings swooped down each side. Between themselves and the stairs waited a knot of people. At their front stood Queen Milena, an amply fed woman in layered silks of garish colors. She wore a cape trimmed in rare spotted fox. Her hair was as long as Kalin's. At first, Richard couldn't figure out what she was holding, but when he heard the yapping, he realized it was a small dog. As they approached, everyone but the queen dropped to a knee in a deep bow. When they stopped, Richard stared openly. He had never seen a queen before. Zed gave him a sideways kick. He dropped to one knee and, following Zed's example, bowed his head. The only two who did not kneel or bow were Kalin and the queen. No sooner was he down than everyone was back up, with him coming to his feet last. Richard guessed that the two women must not have to bow to each other. The queen stared at Kalin, who, with her head held high, didn't break her calm countenance and didn't even look at the queen. No one spoke a word. Kalin lifted her hand a little, only about a foot away from her body, with her arm held unbending, her hand held limply in place. The queen's expression turned darker. Kalin's didn't change. Richard figured that if anyone had blinked, he would have heard it. The queen turned slightly to the side and handed the little dog to a man in a bright green sleeved doublet and black tights with red and yellow striped pantaloons. There was a whole gaggle of men behind the queen dressed in similar fashion. The dog growled viciously and bit the man's hand. He did his best not to notice. The queen lowered herself to both knees in front of Kalin. A young man in plain black clothes immediately came to the queen's side, holding a tray out in front of himself. He bowed, head bent impossibly low, holding the tray out to the queen. She took a small towel from the tray, dipped it in a silver bowl of water, and used it to wipe her lips. She returned the towel to the tray. The queen took the mother confessor's hand lightly in her own and kissed it with her freshly cleaned lips. Fidelity is sworn to the confessors, on my crown, on my land, on my life. Richard had heard few people lie as smoothly. Kalin at last moved her eyes. She looked down at the queen's bowed head. Rise, my child. More than a queen indeed, Richard thought. He remembered teaching Kalin to make a snare, to read tracks, to dig roots, and felt himself turning crimson. Queen Milena laboriously pushed herself to her feet. Her lips smiled. Her eyes didn't. We have not requested a confessor. Nonetheless, I am here. Kalin's voice could have frozen water. Yes, well, this is grand, simply grand. Her face brightened. We will have a banquet. Yes, a banquet. I will send out runners with invitations immediately. Everyone will come. I'm sure they will be most pleased to dine with the Mother Confessor. This is quite an honor. She turned, indicating the men in the red and yellow pantaloons. These are my barristers. The men all bowed deeply again at the introduction. I don't remember all their names. She held her hand out to two men in gold robes. And this is Silas Tannock and Brandon Gadding, the chief advisers to the Crown. The two gave a nod. And my Minister of Finance, Lord Rondell, my star guide, Lady Kiley. Richard didn't see a silver-robed wizard among the Queen's entourage. The Queen waved her hand at a shabbily dressed man in the back. And James, my court artist. From the corner of his eye, Richard saw Zed stiffen. 
James kept his lecherous eyes on Kalin as he gave a shallow bow. He was missing his right hand at the wrist. The oily smile he gave her made Richard reach for his sword instinctively before he realized what he was doing. Without looking over, Zed's hand grabbed his wrist and took the hand away from the sword. Richard glanced around at the other people to see if anyone had noticed. No one had. They were all watching the mother confessor. Kalen turned to the two of them. Zedicus Zorander, cloud reader, trusted advisor to the mother confessor. Zed bowed dramatically. And Richard Cipher, the seeker, protector to the mother confessor. Richard imitated Zed's bow. The queen looked at him, lifting an eyebrow with a sour look. Pretty pathetic protection for a mother confessor. Richard made no change in his expression. Kalen remained unruffled. It is the sword that cuts the man is unimportant. His brain may be small, but his arms are not. He tends to use the sword too often, though. The queen didn't seem to believe her. Behind the royal party, a small girl came gliding down the stairs. She wore a pink satin dress and jewelry that was too large for her. She strode up beside the queen, flipping her long hair back over her shoulder. She did not bow. My daughter, the Princess Violet. Violet, dear, this is the mother confessor. Princess Violet scowled up at Kalen. Your hair is too long. Perhaps we should cut it for you. Richard detected the slightest smile of satisfaction on the queen's face. He decided it was time to elevate her level of worry. The sword of truth came out, sending its distinctive ring around the huge room, the stone amplifying the sound. With the sword point an inch from Princess Violet's nose, he let the anger of it rage through him to make his words more dramatic. Bow to the mother confessor, he hissed, or die. Zed acted bored. Kalin waited calmly. No one else had eyes as wide as the princess as she stared at the sword point. She dropped to her knees and bowed her head. Standing back up, her eyes went to him as if asking if the bow was all right. Be careful how you use that tongue, Richard sneered. The next time I will separate it from you. She nodded and walked around her mother, standing on the far side of her. Richard sheathed his sword, turned, bowed deeply to Kalin, who didn't look at him, and returned to his station behind her. The demonstration had the desired effect on the queen, her voice becoming a bright sing-song. Yes, well, as I was saying, it is grand having you here. We are all simply delighted. Let us show you to our finest room. You must be tired from your journey. Perhaps you would like to rest before dinner, and then after dinner we can all have a nice long... I am not here to eat. Kalen cut her off. I am here to inspect your dungeon. Dungeon? She made a face. It's filthy down there. Are you sure you wouldn't rather... Kalen started walking. I know the way. Richard and Zed fell in behind her. She stopped and turned back to the queen. You will wait here, her voice was like ice, until I am finished. As the queen began bowing her assent, Kaylin strode off with a swish of her dress as she turned on her heels. If Richard hadn't known her as well as he did, the entire encounter would have scared the breath out of him. In fact, he wasn't sure it hadn't. Kalen led them downstairs and through rooms that became less and less grandiose the deeper they went into the castle. Richard was amazed at the size of the place. I was hoping Giller would have been there, Kalen said. Then we wouldn't need to do this. Me too, Zed grumbled. You just make a quick inspection. Ask if anyone wants to give a confession. And when they say no, we go back up and ask to see Giller. He gave her a smile. You've handled it well so far, dear one. She returned the smile to the two of them. And Richard, he cautioned, you keep away from that artist, James. Why? He might draw a bad likeness of me. Wipe that grin off your face. You stay away from him because he might draw a spell around you. A spell? Why would you need an artist to put a spell on someone? Because there are many different languages in the Midlands, though the main one is the same as is spoken in Westland. To be spelled, you have to be able to understand it. If you can't speak their language, you can't put a spell on them. But everyone can understand a drawing. He can draw a spell on almost anyone. Not Kalen or me, but he can on you. Stay away from him. Their footsteps echoed as the three quickly descended stone steps. The walls, far below ground, leaked water and were covered in places with slime. 
Kalin indicated a heavy door to the side. Through here. Richard pulled it open by the iron ring, the strap hinges creaking. Torchlight lit the way down a narrow stone corridor with a ceiling he had to stoop to avoid hitting with his head. Straw covered the wet floor and smelled of decay. Near the end, she slowed to a walk and approached an iron door with a grill in it. Eyes peered out at them when she stopped. Zed leaned around her. The mother confessor here to see the prisoners, he growled. Open the door. Richard could hear the echo of a key turning in the lock. A squat man in a filthy uniform pulled the door inward. An axe hung from his belt next to the keys. He bowed to Kalin, but looked to be annoyed by it. Without a word, he led them through the little room just inside the door, where he had been sitting at a table, eating, and down another dark hall to another iron door. He pounded on it with his fist. The two guards inside bowed in surprise. The three guards took torches from iron stanchions and led them down a short hall and through a third iron door that they all had to duck through. Flickering torchlight pierced the darkness. Behind cross-hatched flat iron bars to each side, men pushed themselves back into the corners, shielding their eyes with their hands from the sudden light. Kalin spoke Zed's name quietly, indicating that she wanted something. He seemed to understand and took a torch from one of the guards and held it up in front of Kalin so all the men in the cells could see her. There were gasps from the darkness when they recognized who she was. Kalin addressed one of the guards. How many of these men are sentenced to die? He stroked his round, unshaven jaw. Why, all of them. All of them, she repeated. He nodded. Crimes against the crown. She pulled her gaze away from him after a moment, turning to the prisoners. Have all you men committed capital offenses? After a moment of silence, a hollow-faced man came and gripped the bars. He spat at her. Kalin swept her hand back to stop Richard before he had a chance to move. Come to do the Queen's dirty work, confessor. I spit on you and your filthy Queen. I do not come here on behalf of the Queen. I come here on behalf of the truth. The truth? The truth is none of us has done a thing, except maybe speaking up against the new laws. And since when is speaking up against your family starving or freezing to death a capital crime? The Queen's tax collectors came and took most of my crops. They barely left enough to feed my family. When I sold the precious little I could spare, they said I was overcharging people. The prices of everything are going wild. I'm doing nothing more than trying to survive, yet I am going to be beheaded for price gouging. These men in here with me are all innocent farmers or tradesmen or merchants. We are all to die for trying to earn a living from our work. Kalin looked to the men in the corner. Do any of you wish to make a confession to prove your innocence? There were hushed whispers. A gaunt man in the darkness stood, came forward. His frightened eyes looked out at them from the gloom. I do. I have done nothing, yet I am to be beheaded. My wife and children left to fend for themselves. I will give a confession. He pushed his arm through the bars, reaching for her. Please, Mother Confessor, take my confession. More men stood, coming forward, all asking to give a confession. Soon they were all at the bars, begging to give a confession. Kalin and Zed exchanged a grim look. In my whole life, I have seen only three men ask to give a confession, she whispered to the wizard. Kalin? The familiar voice came from the cell on the other side from the darkness. Kalin gripped the bars with spread fingers. Sidden? Sidden! She spun to the guards. These men have all given the mother confessor their confessions. I find them to all be innocent. Open the bars. Now, hold on. I can't be letting all these men out. Richard drew the sword in an arc as he spun. The sword crashed a swath through the iron bars, and shards of hot steel and sparks filled the air. He spun around and kicked the iron door shut behind the startled guards. He had the sword at their faces before a single one of them managed to clear an axe from his belt. Open the bars, or I will slice you in half and take the keys from your belt that way. The shaking guard with the keys jumped to do as he was told. The door swung open and Kalin rushed in, going back into the darkness. She came back holding a frightened Sidden in her arms, holding his head against her shoulder. She whispered in his ear, calming him. Sidden jabbered back in the mud people language. She smiled and told him things he smiled back at. As she came out, the guard was opening the other cell door. She held Sidden in one arm, 
and with her free hand she grabbed the guard's shirt collar. The mother confessor finds all these men innocent. Her voice was as hard as the iron around her. They are to be released upon my order. You three are to escort them to safety outside the city. He was a head shorter than she. She pulled his face closer to hers. If you fail in any way, you will answer to me. He nodded vigorously. Yes, Mother Confessor, I understand. It will be done as you say, on my word. On your life, she corrected. She released him. The prisoners poured out of the cells, falling to their knees around her, crying, taking the hem of her dress in their hands, kissing it. She shooed them away. Enough of that. Be on your way, all of you. Just remember, confessors serve no one. They serve only the truth. They all swore they would remember and followed the guards out. Richard saw that many of their shirts were shredded or streaked with dried blood, their backs covered with welts. Before they entered the room where the queen waited, Kaelin stopped and put Sidon into Zed's arms. With her hands, she smoothed his hair, then her dress, and with a deep breath, her face. Just keep in mind what we are here for, Mother Confessor, the wizard said. She gave him a nod, put her chin up, and strode into the room with the queen. Queen Milena waited where they had left her, her entourage still with her. The queen's eyes caught on Sidon. I trust you have found everything in order, Mother Confessor. Kaelin's face stayed calm, but her voice had a cold edge to it. Why is this child in your dungeon? The queen's hand spread wide. Well, I'm not sure. I believe I remember he was found stealing and was put there until his parents could be found, that's all. I can assure you it was nothing more than that. Kaelin regarded her coolly. I have found all the prisoners innocent and ordered them released. I trust you are pleased to find I have saved you from executing innocent men and will see to it that their families are compensated for the trouble this error has caused. If an error such as this is repeated, the next time I return, I will not only empty the prison, I will also empty the throne. Richard knew he wasn't seeing Kaelin putting on a show to get the box. He was seeing her doing her job. This was why the wizards created the confessors. This was who she was, the mother confessor. The queen's eyes opened wide. Why, yes, of course, I have some overly ambitious army commanders, and they must have done this. I had no knowledge of it. Thank you for saving us from making a grave mistake. I will personally see to it that it is taken care of just as you wish, which, of course, is no less than I would have done myself had I... Kaelin cut her off. We will be leaving now. The queen's face brightened. Leaving? Oh, what a shame. We were also looking forward to the honor of your presence at dinner. I'm so sorry you must go. I have other pressing business. Before I go, I wish to speak with my wizard. Your wizard? Giller, she hissed. For the briefest of moments, the queen's eyes flicked toward the ceiling. Well... That would not be possible. Kaelin leaned closer to her. Make it possible, right now. The color drained from the queen's face. Please, believe me, Mother Confessor, you wouldn't want to see Giller in his present condition. Right now, Kaelin repeated. Richard loosened the sword in its scabbard just enough to catch her attention. Very well, he is upstairs. You will wait here until I am finished with him. The queen looked at the floor. Of course, Mother Confessor. She turned to one of the men in the pantaloons. Show her the way. The man led them up the grand stairway to the top floor and down several halls, then up a spiral stone stairway to the top room in a tower, finally stopping with a weak look at a heavy wooden door on the landing. Kalen dismissed him. He bowed, glad to leave. Richard opened the door, they entered, and he closed it behind them. Kaelin gasped and hid her face against Richard's shoulder. Zed pressed Sidden's face to his robes. The room was destroyed completely. The roof was gone as if it had been blasted away, letting in the sunlight and sky. Only a few of the exposed beams remained. A rope hung from one of the beams. Giller's naked body swung slightly as it hung upside down from the end of the rope, a meat hook driven through the bone of his ankle. Were it not for the open roof, the stench would have driven them from the room. 
Zed handed Sidden to Kalin, and ignoring the body, began walking slowly around the circular room, a thoughtful frown on his face. He stopped and touched splinters of furniture that had been driven into the walls as if the stone were made of butter. Richard stood transfixed, staring at Giller's body. Richard, come look at this, Zed called to him. The wizard reached out and ran a finger through a gritty black area on the wall. There were two black areas, in fact. They stood next to each other. Two blackened spots in the shapes of men standing at attention, as if the men had gone and left their shadows behind. Just above each elbow, instead of the black, was a band of gold-colored metal melted into the stone of the wall. Zed turned, raising an eyebrow to him. Wizard's fire. Richard was incredulous. You mean these were men? Zed nodded. Band them right into the wall. He tasted the black smudge on the end of his finger. He smiled to himself. But this was more than just wizard's fire. Richard frowned. Zed pointed at the black on the wall. Taste it. Why? Zed wrapped Richard's head with his knuckles. To learn something. With a grimace, Richard ran his finger through the black grit as Zed had done. It tastes sweet. Zed smiled in satisfaction. This is more than simple wizard's fire. Giller gave his life energy to it. He gave his life into the fire. This was a wizard's life fire. He died making this wizard's fire? Yes, and it tastes sweet. That means he gave his life to save another. If he had done it only for himself, for instance, to spare himself the torture, it would taste bitter. Giller has done this for another. Zed went and stood in front of Giller's body, swishing the flies away, twisting his own head around, trying to turn it upside down for a look. With a finger, he pushed a knotted cord of gut out of the way so he could see Giller's face. He straightened. He has left a message. A message? Kalin asked. What message? There is a smile on his face. A smile frozen in death meant to tell anyone who knows of such things that he did not give up what was wanted. Richard stepped closer as Zed pointed to the opening cut across the abdomen. See here the way this cut goes? This is done by one who practices the magic called anthropomancy, the divining of answers by the inspection of living entrails. Dark and Rahl makes his cut very similar to the way his father did. Richard remembered his own father and how Rahl had done this very thing to him. You are sure it was Dark and Rahl? Kalin asked. Zed shrugged. Who else? Dark and Rahl is the only one who would have been unharmed by a wizard's life fire. Besides, this cut is his signature. Look here. See the end of the opening? See the way it starts to turn? Kalin turned her face away. What of it? That's the hook. At least it should be. It should turn back in a hooked cut. While incantations are spoken, the hook is cut, binding the questioned to the questioner. The hook forces them to give up the answer to the question asked. But see here, the hook is begun, but it is not finished. Zed gave a sad grin. That is when Giller gave his life to the fire. He waited until Raal was almost done, then at the last instant denied him what he sought, probably the name of who has the box. Without life in them, his entrails could tell Raal nothing. I never thought Giller capable of such a selfless act. Kalin whispered. Zed, Richard asked fearfully, how could Giller have done it, taken the pain of having this done to him and managed to leave a smile on his face? Zed gave him a hard look that ran a chill up Richard's spine. Wizards must know about pain. They must know it very well indeed. It is to spare you that lesson that I would happily accept your choice not to be a wizard. It is a lesson few survive. Richard wondered at the mysterious secret things Zed must know, but had never shared with him. Tenderly, Zed cupped a hand to the side of Giller's face. You have done well, my student. Honor in the end. I bet Dark and Rahl was livid, Richard said. Zed, I think we had better get out of here. This looks a little too much like bait on a hook to me. Zed nodded. Wherever the box is, it is not here. At least Raoul does not have it. Yet. He put his hands out. Give me the boy. We need to leave as we came in. 
We don't want to tell them why we were really here. Zed whispered something in Sidden's ear, and the boy giggled, hugging the wizard's neck. Queen Melena was still white, fumbling with the corner of her cape as Kaelin strode purposefully but calmly up to her. Thank you for your hospitality, Kaelin said. We will be leaving now. The queen bowed her head. Always a pleasure to see the mother confessor. Her curiosity overcame her fear. What of Giller? Kaelin appraised her coolly. I regret you have beaten me to him. I only wish I had had the pleasure of doing it myself, or at least witnessed it being done. But the results are all that matter. Disagreement, was it? The color returned to the queen's face. He stole something that belonged to me. I see. Well, I hope you got it back. Good day. She started to move, then stopped. And Queen Melena, I will be back to check and make sure you have brought your overly ambitious commanders back in line and that they are not mistakenly executing innocent people. Richard and Zed, holding Sidden, fell in behind Kaelin as she turned and left. Richard's thoughts swirled desperately through his head as he walked woodenly next to Zed, following Kaelin through all the bowing people and out of the city. What were they going to do now? Shota had warned him that the queen wouldn't have the box for long. She had been right. Where could it be now? He certainly couldn't go back and ask Shota where it was. Who could Giller have given the box to? How were they going to find it? He felt desperately depressed. He felt like giving up. He could tell by the slump in Kaylin's shoulders that she felt the same way. Neither of them spoke. The only one talking was Sidden, and Richard couldn't understand him. What's he saying? he asked Zed. He says he has been being brave, just as Kaylin had told him. But he is glad that Richard with the temper has come to take him home. I guess I know how he feels. Zed, what are we going to do now? Zed gave him a puzzled look. How should I know? You're the seeker. Great. He had just done his best, and they still didn't have the box, but he was expected somehow to find it. He felt as if he had run square into a wall he hadn't known was there. They kept walking, but he didn't know where to go next. The setting sun was golden among golden clouds. Richard thought he could see something ahead in the distance. He moved up and walked next to Kaylin. She was watching it, too. All the people had disappeared from the road for the night. It wasn't long before he knew what it was. It was four horses galloping toward them. Only one had a rider. Chapter 40 Richard touched the hilt of the sword for reassurance as he watched the four horses raising a cloud of dust that turned golden in the setting sun. Soon the sound of thundering hooves reached him. The lone rider bent over his mount, urging him on. Richard lifted the sword a little in its scabbard, checking that it was clear, then let it drop back. As the darkly clad rider approached, Richard realized he looked familiar. Chase! The boundary warden brought the horses to a skidding halt in front of them. He looked down as the dust drifted away. You all look to be well. Chase, is it ever good to see you? Richard grinned. How did you find us? He looked insulted. I'm a boundary warden. He thought that was explanation enough. Find what you were after? No, Richard admitted with a sigh. He saw little arms clutching at Chase's sides. A little face peeked around the black cloak. Rachel, is that you? Her face came farther out, a grin spreading on it. Richard, I'm so happy to see you again. Isn't Chase wonderful? He fought a gar and saved me from being eaten. Didn't fight him, Chase grumbled. Just put a bolt through his head, that's all. But you would have. You're the bravest man I ever saw. With a pained frown, Chase rolled his eyes. Isn't she just about the ugliest child you have ever seen? He leaned around and looked at her. I can't believe a gar would even want to eat you. Rachel giggled and hugged her arms to his sides. Look, Richard. She put a foot out toward him, showing off a shoe. Chase brought down a buck. He said it was a mistake because it was too big, so he traded it to a man. But all the man had to trade were these shoes and this cloak. Aren't they wonderful? And Chase says I can keep them. Richard grinned at her. Yes, that is indeed wonderful. He noticed Rachel's doll and the bundle with the bread nestled between her and Chase. He also noticed her eyes going to Sidden, as if she had seen him before. Kaylin put a hand on Rachel's leg. Why did you run off? You scared us with worry for you. 
Rachel flinched at Kalin's touch. She hugged one arm to Chase and thrust a hand in her pocket. She didn't answer Kalin's question, but looked instead toward Sidden. Why do you have him? Kalin rescued him, Richard said. The queen had him locked up in the dungeon. That's no place for a child, so she took him out. Rachel looked down at Kalin. Wasn't the queen mad? I don't allow anyone to hurt children, Kalin said. Not even a queen. Well, don't just stand there staring. I brought you all horses. Mount up. I figured I'd catch you today. I have a wild boar roasting back at the place you stayed last night, just this side of the Calisidron. With one hand on the saddle and the other arm holding Sidon, Zed leapt to a horse. Wild boar? What kind of fool are you, leaving a wild boar roasting unprotected? Anyone could just come along and take it. Why do you think I want you to hurry? The place is filthy with wolf tracks, though I doubt they'd come near a fire. Don't you dare hurt that wolf, Zed warned. He's a friend of the Mother Confessor. Chase cast an eye to Kalen, then to Richard, before turning his horse and leading them into the setting sun. Richard was heartened by having Chase back. It made him feel once again that anything was possible. After she had mounted, Kalen took Sidden, the two of them talking and laughing as they rode. At the camp, Zed wasted no time before checking the roasting boar and pronounced it fit to eat. He shifted his robes and sat down, waiting with a grin on his wrinkled face for someone with a knife to carve dinner. Sidden, with a grin frozen on his face, too, leaned against Kalen after she sat down. Richard and Chase started carving up the boar. Rachel sat close to Chase's side, watching him, keeping an eye to Kalen, her doll in her lap, and the loaf of bread wrapped in the cloth at her hip. Richard cut a big piece and handed it to Zed. So, what happened? With my brother, I mean. Chase grinned. When I told him the things you told me to tell him, he said that if you were in trouble, he was going to help. He pulled together the army, and we sent most of them into defensive positions along the boundary, with the wardens commanding them. After the boundary came down, he refused to wait behind. He led a thousand of his best men into the Midlands. They're all bivouacked up in the Rang Shada right now, waiting to help you. Richard had stopped carving, frozen in astonishment. Really? My brother said that? He came to help and with an army? Chase nodded. He said if you're in this, then he is too. Richard felt a pang of regret that he had doubted Michael, and elation that his brother would drop everything to come help. He wasn't angry? I thought sure he would be and give me grief over this, but he only wanted to know about you, what risk you were at, and where you were. He said he knew you, and if you thought it was this important, then he did too. He offered to come along, but I wouldn't let him. He's with his men, probably waiting in his tent right now, pacing back and forth. I have to tell you, it surprised me too. Richard's eyes were wide in wonder. My brother and a thousand of his men in the Midlands come to help me. He looked at Kalen. Isn't that wonderful? She only smiled at him. Chase gave him a stern look while he carved. For a while, I thought you were finished when I saw your trail going into Agaden Reach. Richard looked up. You went into the Reach? Do I look stupid? You don't become head of the Boundary Wardens by being stupid. I started thinking of how I was going to tell Michael you were dead. Then I found your trail coming out of the Reach. His brow wrinkled together. How did you manage to come out of the Reach alive? Richard gave him a grin. I think the good spirits... Rachel screamed. Richard and Chase spun with their knives. Before Chase could use his knife, Richard stopped him. It was Brophy. Rachel? Is that you, Rachel? She took her doll's foot from her mouth. Her eyes were wide. You sound like Brophy. The wolf's tail swished back and forth. That's because I am Brophy. He trotted over to her. Brophy? How come you're a wolf? He sat on his haunches in front of her. Because a kind wizard changed me into a wolf. That's what I wanted to be, and he changed me. Giller changed you into a wolf? The breath caught in Richard's throat. That's right. It's a wonderful new life I have. She threw her arms around the wolf's neck. Brophy licked her face as she giggled. Rachel, Richard said, you know Giller? Rachel hugged an arm around Brophy's neck. Giller's a nice man. He gave me Sarah. She gave a fearful look to Kalen. You want to hurt him. You're the queen's friend. You're mean. She pushed against Brophy for protection. Brophy gave her face a long lick. You're wrong, Rachel. Kalen is my friend. 
She is one of the nicest people in the world. Kaylin smiled and held her hands out to Rachel. Come here. Rachel looked to Brophy, who gave her a nod that it was all right. She went with a pout on her face. Kaylin took Rachel's hands in hers. You heard me say something mean about Giller, didn't you? Rachel nodded. Rachel, the queen, is a bad person. I didn't know how bad until today. Giller used to be my friend. When he went to live with the queen, I thought it was because he was bad too and was on her side. I was wrong. I would never hurt Giller now that I know he is still my friend. Rachel turned her eyes up to Richard. She's telling you the truth. We're on the same side as Giller. Rachel turned to Brophy. He nodded, too, that it was the truth. You and Richard aren't friends of the Queen? Kaylin laughed a little. No. If I have my way, she will not be the Queen much longer. And as for Richard, well, he drew his sword and threatened to kill the Princess. I don't think that makes him friends with the Queen. Rachel's eyes got big. Princess Violet? You did that to Princess Violet? Richard nodded to her. She said some bad things to Kaylin, and I told her that if she did it again, I'd cut off her tongue. Rachel's mouth dropped open. And she didn't say to chop off your head? We are not going to let them chop off any more heads, Kaylin said. Rachel's eyes filled with tears as she looked to Kaylin. I thought you were mean and that you would hurt Giller. I'm so happy you're not mean. She put her arms around Kaylin's neck, hugging her tight. Kaylin hugged her back just as tight. Chase leaned toward Richard. You pulled a sword on a princess. Do you know that's a capital offense? Richard gave him a cool look. If I'd had the time, I would have put her over my knee and spanked her, too. Rachel giggled at that. Richard smiled at her. You know the princess, don't you? The laughter left her. I'm her playmate. I lived in a nice place with other children, but after my brother died, the queen came and picked me out to be the princess's playmate. Richard turned to Brophy. He was the one? The wolf nodded solemnly. So, you lived with the princess. She's the one who cut your hair all crooked, isn't she? She hits you. Rachel nodded with a pout. She's mean to people. She's starting to say to chop off people's heads. I was afraid she would chop off my head, too, so I ran away. Richard eyed the loaf of bread she kept at her hip. He squatted down next to her. Giller helped you run away, didn't he? She was near tears. Giller gave me Sarah. He wanted to run away with me, but then a mean man came. Father Rahl. He looked real mad at Giller. Giller told me to run and hide until winter, then to find a new family to live with. A tear ran down her cheek. Sarah told me he couldn't come with me anymore. Richard glanced again at the loaf of bread. It was about the right size. He put his hands on her shoulders. Rachel, Zed and Kalen and Chase and I are fighting against Dark and Rahl so that he won't be able to hurt people anymore. She turned her head back to Chase. Chase nodded. He's telling you the truth, child. You tell him the truth, too. He tightened his grip on her shoulders. Rachel, did Giller give you that loaf of bread? She nodded. Rachel, we were going to Giller to get a box, a box to help us stop Dark and Rawl from hurting people. Will you give it to us? Will you help us stop Rawl? Her watery eyes looked at him. Then, with a brave smile, she picked up the bread and handed it to him. It's in the loaf of bread. Giller hid it in there with magic. Richard threw his arms around her, nearly hugging the breath out of her. He stood, hugging her to him, and spun in circles until she giggled. Rachel, you are the bravest, smartest, prettiest girl I have ever known. When he set her down, she ran to Chase and crawled into his lap. He mussed her hair and put his big arms around her as she smiled and hugged him. Richard picked up the loaf of bread in both hands. He held it out to Kaylin. She smiled and shook her head. He held it to Zed. The seeker found it, Zed smiled. The seeker should open it. Richard broke the bread open, and there inside was the jeweled box of Orden. He wiped his hands on his pants, pulled the box out, and held it up to the firelight. He knew from the Book of Counted Shadows that the glittering box they saw was only a covering for the real box underneath. He even knew from the box how to remove the cover. He put the box in Kaylin's lap. As she picked it up, she gave him the biggest smile he had ever seen. Before he even knew what he had done, he had leaned over and given Kaylin a quick kiss. Her eyes went wide and she didn't kiss him back, but the feel of her lips shocked him into realizing what he had done. Oh, sorry, he said. She laughed. 
forgiven. Richard hugged Zed as they both laughed. Chase laughed watching them. Richard could hardly believe that just a short time ago he had almost given up, had no idea what to do next, where to go, or how to stop Rawl. And now they had the box. He set it on a rock where they could all see it in the firelight while they had the best dinner Richard could ever remember. Richard and Kalen told Chase some of what they had been through. To Richard's delight, Chase was disturbed to learn that he owed his life to Bill back at Southhaven. Chase told them some of his own stories of bringing an army of a thousand men across the Rang Shada. He enjoyed telling drawn-out tales of the foolishness of bureaucracy in the field. Rachel cuddled in Chase's lap while she ate and he talked. Richard thought it was interesting that she chose the most fearsome among them for comfort. When at last he finished his story, she looked up and asked, Chase, where should I go to hide until winter? He regarded her with a glower. You're too ugly to be left to wander about. A gar would eat you sure. That made her laugh. I have other children. They're all ugly, too. You'll fit right in. I guess I'll take you to live in my house. Really, Chase? Richard asked. I've come home enough times and had my wife present me with a new child. I think it's about time I turned affairs about on her. He looked down at Rachel, who clung to him as if he might float away. But I have rules, you know. You have to follow my rules. I'll do anything you say, Chase. Well, there you go. That's the first rule. I don't allow any of my children to call me Chase. If you want to be a member of my family, you have to call me Father. And about your hair. It's too short. My children all have long hair, and I like it that way. You'll have to let your hair grow out some. And you'll have a mother. You'll have to mind her. And you'll have to play with your new brothers and sisters. Do you think you can do all that? She nodded against him, unable to talk as she hugged him, tears glistening in her eyes. They all excitedly ate their fill. Even Zed seemed to have had enough. Richard felt exhausted, and at the same time full of energy, to finally have the box in their hands. They had done the hard part. They had found the box before Rawl. Now they had only to keep it from him until winter. We have been weeks in this quest, Kalen said. The first day of winter is a month away. Earlier today, that seemed scarcely enough time to get the box. Now that we have it, it seems forever. What shall we do until it is finished? Chase spoke up first. We have all of us to protect the box, and we have a thousand men to protect us. When we get back across the border, we will have many times that. She looked at Zed. Do you think that's wise? We would be easy to find, a thousand men, I mean. Would it not be better to hide somewhere by ourselves? Zed leaned back and rubbed his full stomach. We could hide better by ourselves, but we would also be more vulnerable if discovered. Perhaps Chase is correct. There would be a lot of protection among a force that large, and if we had to, we could still leave them and go to cover. We better get an early start, Richard said. It was barely light when they were off, the horses to the road, Brophy to woods, shadowing them, or at times scouting ahead. Chase, bristling with weapons, led them at a trot, Rachel holding him tight. Kaylin, back in her forest garb and with Sidden sitting at her lap, rode next to Zed. Richard had insisted that Zed carry the box. It was wrapped in the cloth that held the bread before and tied to the horn of his saddle. Richard followed behind, watching everything as they rode quickly into the cold morning air. Now that they had the box, he felt suddenly vulnerable, as if somehow everyone would know just by looking at them. Richard could hear the waters of the Calisidron before they rounded the curve to the bridge. He was glad to see the road deserted. Chase spurred his horse to a gallop as he approached the big wooden bridge, the rest of them giving a heel to their horses to keep pace. Page 444 Richard knew what Chase was doing. The boundary warden had always told him that bridges were the bane of the unwary. Richard watched in every direction as the other three galloped across in front of him. He saw nothing. In the exact center of the bridge, at a full gallop, he ran solidly into something that wasn't there. Stunned, Richard sat up, dumbfounded at finding himself on the ground and seeing his big roan running with the other horses, then stopping with them as they halted and turned. The others looked back in confusion as Richard, still dazed and bewildered, rose painfully to his feet. He brushed himself off and started limping to retrieve his horse. Before he reached the center of the bridge, he smacked into it again. It felt like walking into a stone wall, but there was nothing there. 
he found himself sitting on the ground again. The others were around him this time as he got to his feet. Zed was off his horse, holding his reins in one hand and helping Richard with the other. What's the matter? I don't know, Richard managed. It felt like I ran into a wall right in the center of the bridge. I must have just fallen off, that's all. I think I'm all right now. Zed looked around, led him forward with a hand on his elbow. Before going far, he hit it again, but this time he had been moving slowly and wasn't knocked from his feet, only back a few steps. He took one slow step forward and came in contact with it again. Zed gave a serious frown. Richard put his hands out, feeling the solid form of the smooth wall that wouldn't let him pass, but would let the rest of them through. The touch of it made him feel dizzy and sick. Zed walked back and forth through the invisible barrier. The wizard stood where the unseen wall stood. Walk back to the end of the bridge, then walk to me. Richard felt the lump on his forehead as he walked back to the end of the bridge. Kaylin jumped off her horse next to Zed. Brophy came up beside her to see what the trouble was. This time, as he walked, Richard held his hands out in front of himself. Before he was halfway back, he made solid contact and could go no farther, having to back away from the sickening feeling at its touch. Zed rubbed his chin. Bags! The rest of them came to Richard, since he couldn't come to them. Zed led him forward again. When he made contact, he backed away a little. Zed took Richard's left hand. Touch it with your other hand. Richard did as he was told until the sick feeling made him withdraw his hand. Zed seemed to feel it through Richard. By now they were at the foot of the bridge. Every touch of the thing had made it move back the way they had come. Bags and double bags. What is it? Richard demanded. Zed took a glance to Kalen and Chase before he spoke. It's a keeper spell. What's a keeper spell? It's a spell drawn by that filthy artist James. He's drawn it around you. And then, when you touched it the first time, it activated the spell. Once you touch it, it pulls tighter like a trap. If we don't get it off you, it will shrink until you are all that's in it, and then you won't be able to move. Then what? Zed straightened. The touch of it is poison. When it finishes closing around you like a cocoon, it will crush you, or the poison of it will kill you. Kaylin grabbed the sleeve of Zed's robes, panic in her eyes. We have to go back. We have to get it off him. Zed pulled his arm free. Well, of course we do. We'll find the drawing and erase it. I know where the sacred caves are, Kaylin offered, as she grabbed hold of her saddle and put a foot in the stirrup. The wizard turned to retrieve his horse. We don't have any time to waste. Let's go. No, Richard said. They all turned back to stare at him. Richard, we have to, Kalen said. She's right, my boy. There's no other way. No. He looked at their startled faces. That's what they want us to do. You said the artist couldn't spell you or Kalen, so he did it to me, thinking that would get us all back. The box is too important. We can't take the risk. He looked to Kalen. You just tell me where these caves are, and Zed, you tell me how to erase the spell. Kaylin grabbed the reins of her horse and Richard's, pulling them forward. Zed and Chase can protect the box. I'm going with you. No, you're not. I'm going alone. I have the sword to protect me. The box is all that matters. It is our first responsibility. We must protect it above all else. Just tell me where the caves are and how to fix the spell. When I'm finished, I'll catch up with you. Richard, I think... No. This is about stopping Dark and Rawl, not about any one of us. This is not a request, it's an order. They straightened, Zed turning to Kalen. Tell him where the caves are. Kalen angrily handed the reins of her horse to Zed and snatched up a stick. She drew a map in the dirt of the road, pulling the stick along one of the lines she had drawn. This is the Calisidron, and here the bridge. This is the road, and here Tamarang and the castle. She drew the line of a road to the north of the city. Here, in these hills northeast of the city, there is a stream that runs between twin hills. They're about a mile south of a small bridge that crosses the stream. The twin hills have cliffs on the sides toward the stream. The sacred caves are in the cliff on the northeast side of the stream. That is where the artist draws his spells. Zed took the stick from her and broke off two finger-length pieces. He rolled one between his palms. Here. This will erase the curse. 
Without seeing it, I can't tell you what part you must erase. But you should be able to figure it out. It's a drawing, and you will be able to make some sense of it. That is the whole purpose of a drawn spell. You must be able to make sense of it, or it won't work. The stick Zed had rolled in his palms no longer felt like wood. It felt soft and tacky. Richard put it in his pocket. Zed rolled the other piece in his palms. He handed it to Richard, it too no longer a stick. This time it was black, almost like charcoal, but hard. With this, the wizard said, you can draw on the spell and change it if you have to. Change it how? I can't tell you without seeing it. You'll have to use your own judgment. Now hurry. But I still think we should... No, Zed. We all know what Dark and Rawl is capable of. The box is all that is important, not any one of us. He shared a deep look with his old friend. Take care of yourself. And Kalen. He looked up to Chase. Get them to Michael. Michael will be able to protect the box better than we can alone. And don't hold back waiting for me. I'll catch up. Richard gave him a hard stare. If I don't, I don't want any of you coming back for me. You just get the box away from here, understand? Chase gave him a serious look. On my life. He gave Richard brief instructions to find the Westland Army up in the Rong Shada. Richard looked to Kalen. Take care of Sidden. Don't worry. I'll be back with you soon enough. Now get going. Zed mounted his horse. Kalen handed Sidden over to the wizard. She gave Chase and Zed a nod. Go on, get started. I will catch up in a few minutes. Zed started to protest, but she cut him off and told him again to start ahead. She watched the two horses and the wolf gallop across the bridge and down the road before she turned back to Richard. Concern cut deeply into her features. Richard, please let me... No. She nodded and handed him the reins to his horse. Tears were filling her green eyes. There are dangers in the Midlands you know nothing about. Be careful. A tear ran down her cheek. I'll be back with you before you have time to miss me. I'm afraid for you. I know, but I'll be all right. She looked up at him with eyes he could lose himself in. I shouldn't be doing this, she whispered. Kaylin threw her arms around his neck and kissed him. Hard, fast, desperate. For a moment, as he reached his arms around her and pulled her tight against him, the touch of her lips on his... The little moan that came from her and the feeling of her fingers through the back of his hair made him forget his own name. He was in a daze as he watched her put a boot in the stirrup and throw her other leg over the saddle. She pulled the reins, bringing her horse around close to him. Don't you dare do anything stupid, Richard Cipher. Promise me. I promise. He didn't tell her that he thought letting harm reach her was what he considered stupid above all else. Don't worry. I'll be back with you just as soon as I get rid of this spell. Protect the box. Rawl must not get it. That's what matters. Now get going. He stood, holding the reins of his horse, watching her gallop across the bridge and disappear into the distance. I love you, Kalen Amnell, he whispered. With an encouraging pat to the splotch of gray on the roan's neck, Richard headed the big horse off the road after crossing the small bridge and spurred it along the bank of the stream. The horse ran with ease, splashing its hooves in the shallow water when the brush blocked the way along the bank. Sunlit hills, mostly barren of trees, rose up around the stream. As the banks became steeper, he led the horse up along the higher ground, where it could make easier progress. Richard kept a watch for anyone following or observing, but saw no one. The hills seemed deserted. Chalk-white cliffs rose up to either side of the stream, cleft faces on identical hills straddling the water. Richard was off the horse before it stopped. Looking about, he tethered it to a sumac, whose red fruit was already dried and shriveled. His boots slid on the loose ground as he descended the steep bank. There was a narrow foot trail through the slide of rock and dirt. Following it brought him to the tall mouth of a cave. With a hand on the hilt of the sword, he peeked around the opening, checking for the artist or anyone else. There was no one. Immediately inside the cave were drawings on the walls. They covered every surface and continued back into the darkness. Richard was overwhelmed. There were hundreds of drawings, maybe thousands. Some were little, no bigger than his hand. Some were larger, tall as he. Each depicted a different scene. Most had only one person in them, but a few had many people. It was obvious that they had been drawn by different hands. 
Some were delicately rendered, rich in detail, with shading and highlights, depicting people with broken limbs or drinking from cups with skulls and crossed bones on them, or standing next to fields of withered crops. Others were done by someone with little talent for the task. Their figures were drawings of people made of simple lines, but the scenes in these were similarly gruesome. Richard guessed that the talent of the artist was of little importance. It was the message that counted. Richard found drawings done by different hands, but of the same subject. These people might have a map of some sort around them, but around each was a line drawn in a circle, the circle having a skull and crossed bones on it somewhere. Keeper spells. But how was he to find his? There were drawings everywhere. He didn't know what the drawing of his spell looked like. He searched the walls with growing panic, moving deeper into the darkness. He ran his hands over the pictures as he moved, trying to look at each so as not to miss his. His eyes darted everywhere, overwhelmed by the number of spells, searching for something familiar, not knowing exactly what to look for or where. Richard worked his way back into the darkness, reasoning that maybe there was an end to the drawings and maybe the latest were at the end. It was too dark to see. He went toward the mouth of the cave to retrieve reed cane torches he had seen there. Before he had gone far, he ran smack into the invisible wall. With rising panic, he realized that he was trapped in the cave. He was running out of time. The torches were out of reach. He ran back into the darkness, searching. He had trouble seeing the spells, and still there was no end to them. A thought he definitely didn't like came to him. If there be need enough, the nightstone. With no time to lose, he pulled the leather pouch from his pack. He looked at it in his hand, trying to decide if this would be a help or simply more trouble. Trouble he couldn't handle. He thought about the times he had seen the stone out of the pouch. Each time, it had taken a while for the shadow things to come. Maybe if he just pulled it out for a short time, had a look into the darkness, and then put the stone back, he would have the time he needed before the shadows found him. He didn't know if it was a good idea. If there be need enough. He dumped the stone into his hand. Light filled the cave. Richard wasted no time looking at individual drawings, but instead quickly went deeper, looking for where they ended. From the corner of his eye, he saw the first shadow materialize. It was still a ways off. He kept going. At last, he came to the end of the drawings. The shadows were almost upon him. He thrust the stone back in the leather pouch. In the darkness, he held his breath, eyes wide, expecting the painful touch of death. It didn't come. The only light was a dim glow with a bright spot in the center, the entrance, but it didn't provide enough light to see the drawings. He knew he would have to take out the stone again. First, with his fingers, he searched through his pocket and found the soft, tacky piece of stick Zed had given him. With it firmly in hand, he pulled the stone out again. The light blinded him for a second. His head swiveled around, looking. Then he saw it. The man in the drawing was as tall as he, but the rest of the drawing was larger still. It was crude, but he knew it was him. The sword held in the right hand had the word truth written on it. There was a map around the figure, similar to the one Kalin had drawn on the ground. On one side, the line around the outside edges went down the calicidron and across the center of the bridge. That was where he had run into it. The shadows called his name. He looked up to see hands reaching for him. He thrust the stone into the pouch and pressed his back against the wall, over his drawing, listening to his heart pounding in his ears. In dismay, he realized that the drawing was too large for him to erase the entire circle around him. If he only erased part of it, he had no way of knowing where the gap would be or how to make the gap where he was in the cave. He backed away to prepare himself to get a better look the next time he pulled the stone out. He bumped into the invisible wall. His heart felt as if it skipped a beat. The wall was almost around him. He had no time. He pulled the stone out and immediately started erasing the sword, hoping that would take away his identity, take the spell off him. The lines erased only with great difficulty. He backed away a step to look and hit the wall. The shadows reached for him, calling his name seductively. He dumped the stone back into the pouch and stood in the blackness, breathing hard, near panic at the feeling of being trapped. He knew he couldn't use the sword to fight the shadow things while he worked on the drawing. He had fought the shadows before, and it took everything he had. His mind raced. He couldn't think of what to do. He had erased the sword, and that didn't work. The spell must still recognize him. 
He knew there wasn't enough time to erase the line all the way around him. His breath came in a desperate pant. There was flickering light. He spun around. A man holding one of the reed torches came closer, an oily smile on his face. It was James, the artist. I thought I might find you here. I came to watch. Anything I can do to help? By his laugh, Richard knew James wasn't about to help him. James also knew that with the wall between them, Richard couldn't use the sword on him. He laughed at Richard's helplessness. Richard cast a quick glance sideways. The torch gave enough light for him to see the drawing. The invisible wall pushed at his shoulder, pushed him toward the wall. A wave of nausea and dizziness went through him at the touch. He was only a step away from the cave wall as it was. In moments, he would be encased, crushed, or poisoned. Richard spun to the drawing. While he worked with one hand, he searched his pocket with the other. He pulled out the stick Zed had told him he could use to alter the drawing. James leaned forward with a chuckle watching him work. The chuckle stopped. What are you doing there? Richard didn't answer as he erased the right hand on the figure. Stop that! James yelled. Richard ignored him and kept erasing. James threw the torch on the ground and pulled out a drawing stick of his own. The artist started drawing in fast, slashing strokes, strands of his greasy hair whipping around as he worked. He was drawing a figure. He was drawing another spell. Richard knew that if James finished first, there would be no second chance. Stop that, you fool! James yelled as he raced to complete his drawing. The unseen wall pressed up against Richard's back, forcing him against the wall of the cave. He barely had room to move his arms. James was drawing a sword, starting to write the word truth. Richard took his drawing stick and with a line connected the sides of the wrist of the figure making a stump, just like the one James had. As he finished it, the pressure on his back lifted and the sick feeling left. James screamed. Richard turned to see him writhing on the floor of the cave, folding himself into a ball as he vomited. Richard shuddered and picked up the torch. The artist's pleading eyes came up to him. I wasn't going to let it kill you, only trap you. Who had you do this spell on me? James gave a wicked little smile. The Maud Sith, he whispered. You are going to die. What's a Maud Sith? Richard heard the breath being squeezed from him, bones snapping. James was dead. Richard couldn't say he was sorry. Richard didn't know what a moored Sith was, but he didn't want to wait around to find out. Suddenly, he felt alone and vulnerable. Zed and Kalin both had warned him that there were many things in the Midlands, many creatures of magic that were dangerous, that he knew nothing about. He hated the Midlands, the magic. He just wanted to get back to Kalin. Richard ran toward the cave entrance, dropping the torch along the way. Running out into the bright sunlight, shielding his eyes, he came to a halt. Squinting, he saw a ring of people around him soldiers. They wore uniforms of dark leather and mail, swords over their shoulders, battle axes at their wide belts. At their lead, facing the cave, facing him, was someone different, a woman with long auburn hair pulled back into a loose braid. She was sheathed in leather from neck to ground, cut to fit like a glove, blood-red leather. The only deviation from the blood-red of it was a yellow crescent and star across her stomach. Richard saw that the men wore the same crescent and star on their chests, only theirs was red. She watched him with no emotion except the slightest wisp of a smile. Richard stood with his feet spread defensively, his hand on the hilt of the sword, not knowing what to do without a clue to their intent. Her eyes gave a little flick, looking above and behind him. Richard heard two men drop from the cliff wall to the ground behind him. He could feel the anger of the sword racing urgently into him through his hand on the hilt. He held it at full rage as he gritted his teeth. The woman snapped her fingers at the men behind him, then pointed at him. Take him. He heard the sound of steel being drawn. That was everything Richard needed to know. The commitment had been made. Bringer of death. His sword came out in an arc as he spun. He let the anger loose with a vengeance. It exploded through him. His eyes met those of the two men. Their jaws were set in a rage of their own as their swords cleared the scabbards over their shoulders. Richard kept the sword of truth low, waist height with all his weight and strength behind it. Their swords came down defensively. 
He screamed with lethal rage, lethal hate, lethal need. He gave himself completely over to the lust to kill, knowing anything less would be the end of him. His sword tip whistled, bringer of death. Shards of hot shattered steel spiraled through the clear morning air. Twin grunts. At impact, twin wet thwacks like ripe melons hitting the ground. Insides turned out in long red ropes. The top halves of their bodies tumbled as the legs collapsed. The sword continued around, tracing its route with strings of blood. He refocused the rage, the hate, the need. She commanded them. Richard wanted her lifeblood. The magic surged through him unhindered. He was still screaming. She stood with a hand on her hip. Richard met her eyes, made a slight alteration to the course of the sword so it too would meet them. Her widening smile only fed the violent fire of his wrath. Their eyes locked together. The sword tip whistled around toward her head. His need to kill was beyond retrieval. Bringer of death. The pain of the sword's magic hit him like a waterfall of icy water on naked flesh. The blade never reached her. The sword clattered to the ground as the pain took him to his knees, ripping through him, doubling him over. Hand still on her hip, smile still on her face, she stood over him, watching as he clutched his arms across his abdomen, vomiting blood, choking on it. Fire burned through every inch of him. The pain of the magic consumed him, took his breath from his lungs. Desperately, he tried to get a grip on the magic, tried to put away the pain as he had learned to do before. It did not respond to his will. With rising panic, he realized he no longer had control of it. She did. He collapsed to his face in the dirt, trying to scream, to breathe, but couldn't. He thought about Kalin for an instant. Then the pain took even that from him. Not one of the men moved from the circle. The woman put a boot on the back of his neck and an elbow on her knee as she leaned over. With her other hand, she grabbed a fistful of his hair and lifted his head. She leaned closer, the leather creaking. My, my, she hissed. And here I thought I was going to have to torture you for days and days before I finally made you angry enough to use your magic against me. Well, not to worry. I have other reasons to torture you. Through his pain, Richard realized he had made a fearful mistake. He had somehow given her the control of the sword's magic. He knew he was in more trouble than he had ever been in in his life. Kalin was safe, he told himself. That was all that mattered. Do you want the pain to stop, my pet? The question enraged him. His anger at her, his want to kill her, twisted the pain tighter. No, he managed with all of his strength. She shrugged, dropping his head. Fine by me. But when you decide you want the pain of the magic to stop, all you have to do is stop thinking those nasty thoughts about me. From now on, I control the magic of your sword. If you so much as think of lifting a finger against me, the pain of the magic will take you down. She smiled. That is the only pain you will have any control over. Just think something pleasant about me, and it will stop. Of course, I too will have control over the pain of the magic, and can bring it to you any time I choose, and I can bring you other pain too, as you will learn. She frowned. Tell me, my pet, did you try to use the magic on me because you are a fool or because you fancy yourself as brave? The pain let up the smallest bit. He gasped for air. She had relaxed it just enough to allow him to answer. Who are you? She took a fistful of his hair again, lifted his head, twisted it around to look into his eyes. As she leaned over, the boot on his neck sent a shard of pain through his shoulders. He couldn't move his arms. Her face was wrinkled in a frown of curiosity. You don't know who I am? Everyone in the Midlands knows me. I'm Westland. Her eyebrows lifted in delight. Westland, my, my, how delicious. This is going to be fun. Her smile widened. I am Denna, Mistress Denna to you, my pet. I am a moored Sith. I'll not tell you where Kalin is. You might as well kill me now. Who? Kalin? The Mother Confessor. Mother Confessor, she said with distaste. Why in the world would I want to confess her? 
It is you, Richard Cipher, that Master Rahl sent me for. No one else. One of your friends has betrayed you to him. She twisted his head up harder, pushed her boot down harder. And now I have you. I had thought it might be difficult, but you hardly made it any fun at all. I'm to be in charge of your training. But then you wouldn't know about that since you are from Westland. You see, a Mord Sith always wears red when she's to train someone. That's so your blood won't show so much. I have a wonderful feeling I'm going to have a lot of your blood on me before I have you trained. She dropped his head and leaned her full weight on her boot, holding her hand out in front of his face. He could see that the back of her gloved hand was armored, even the fingers. A blood-red leather rod about a foot long hung loosely from her wrist by an elegant gold chain. It swung back and forth in front of his eyes. This is the Aegeal. This is part of what I will use to train you. She gave him a smooth smile, arching an eyebrow. Curious? Want to see how it works? Denna pressed the Aegeal against his side. The shock of the pain made him cry out, even though he had no intention of giving her the satisfaction of seeing how much it hurt. Every muscle in his body locked rigid with the agony of the thing against his side. His mind was filled with the want of having it off him. Denna pushed the slightest bit harder, making him scream louder. He heard a pop and felt a rib crack. She took the Aegeal away. Warm blood oozed down his side. Richard was covered in sweat as he lay in the dirt, panting, tears running from his eyes. He felt as if the pain were pulling every muscle in his body apart. There was dirt in his mouth and blood. Denna gave him a cruel sneer. Now, my pet, say thank you, Mistress Denna, for teaching me. Her face came closer. Say it. With all his mental strength, Richard focused his hunger to kill her and envisioned the sword exploding through her head. Die, bitch! Denna shuddered and half closed her eyes, running her tongue over her upper lip in ecstasy. Oh, that was a deliciously naughty vision, my pet. Of course you will learn to be seriously sorry you did it. Training you is going to be exquisite fun. Too bad you don't know what a Mord Sith is. If you did, you would be very afraid. I would enjoy that. Her smile showed her perfect teeth. But I think I'm going to delight in surprising you even more. Richard maintained the vision of killing her until he was unconscious. Chapter 41 Richard's eyes came open a little. His mind was in a fog. He was face down on a cold stone floor lit by flickering torchlight. The stone walls had no windows to tell him if it was day or night. There was a coppery taste in his mouth. Blood. He tried to think of where he could be and why. A sharp pain in his side caught his breath when he tried to inhale too deeply. His whole body hurt. He throbbed everywhere. It felt as if someone had given him a beating with a club. The memory of the nightmare seeped back into his mind. At the thought of Denna, his anger flashed. Instantly, the pain of the magic made him inhale in a gasp. The unexpected shock of it made him draw his knees up and let out a moan of agony. He recoiled from the anger, put her from his mind. He thought of Kalen, remembering the way she had kissed him. The pain melted away. Desperately, he tried to keep his mind on Kalen. He couldn't take the pain again. He couldn't bear it. He already hurt too much. He had to think of a way out of this. If he didn't get control of his anger, he had no chance. He remembered how his father had taught him that anger was wrong, how for most of his life he had been able to keep it choked off. Zed had told him that there were times when bringing the anger out was more dangerous than keeping it in. This was one of those times. He had a whole lifetime of experience at keeping his anger under control. He must do it now. That thought gave him a sliver of hope. Carefully, without moving too much, he took appraisal. His sword was back in its scabbard, his knife still in its sheath, the nightstone still in his pocket. His pack lay against a far wall. The left side of his shirt was hard with dried blood. His head pounded with pain, but felt no worse than the rest of him. Turning his head a little, he saw Denna. She was stretched out at an angle in a wooden chair with her ankles crossed. 
Her right elbow rested on a simple wooden table as she spooned something into her mouth from a bowl she held in her other hand. She was watching him. He thought maybe he should say something. Where are your men? Denna kept chewing for a time as she watched him. At last, she set the bowl down and pointed at a spot on the floor next to her. Her voice was calm, almost gentle. Come and stand here. With great difficulty, Richard rose to his feet and walked to stand where she had pointed. She watched him without emotion as he stood looking down at her. He waited in silence. She stood and with her boot pushed the chair back out of the way. She was almost as tall as he. She turned her back to him as she picked up a glove off the table and worked it onto her right hand, pushing the fingers down tight. Abruptly, she spun around, backhanding him across the mouth. The armored back of the glove split his lip open on his teeth. Immediately before the anger could grip him, he thought about a beautiful place in the Heartland Woods. His eyes watered from the sting of the gash. Denna gave him a warm smile. You forgot the appellation, my pet. I told you before you are to address me as Mistress or as Mistress Denna. You are lucky to have me as your trainer. Most Mord Sith are not as lenient as I. They would have used the Aegeal at the first offense, but I have a soft spot in my heart for good-looking men, and besides, even though the glove isn't a very effective punishment, I must admit I rather favor using it. I like to feel the contact. The Aegeal is exhilarating, but there is no substitute for using your own hands to feel what you're doing. She gave a little frown, her voice hardening. Take your hand away. Richard took his hand off his mouth and held both at his sides. He could feel the blood dripping from his chin. Denna watched it in satisfaction. Unexpectedly, she leaned forward and licked some of the blood off his chin, smiling at the taste. It seemed to excite her. She pressed herself against him, but this time she sucked his lip in her mouth and bit it hard on the cut. Richard squeezed his eyes shut, his hands in fists, and held his breath until she backed away, licking the blood from her lips with a smile. He shook with the pain, but held the vision of the Heartland Woods in his mind. That was just a gentle warning, as you will soon learn. Now, repeat the question properly. Richard decided on the spot that he would call her Mistress Denna, and that it would to him be a term of disrespect, and that he would never, ever call her simply Mistress. It would be his way of fighting her, of keeping his self-respect, in his own mind at least. Richard took a deep breath to steady his voice. Where are your men, Mistress Denna? Much better, she cooed. Most Mord Sith don't allow those in training to talk or to ask questions, but I think that becomes boring. I'd rather like to talk to my trainee. As I said, you are lucky to have me. She gave him a cool smile. I've sent my men away. I no longer need them. They are only used for capture and to hold the captive until he uses his magic against me. Then they are no longer needed. There is nothing you can do to get away or fight back. Nothing. And why do I still have my sword and knife? Too late, he remembered. With an arm, he blocked her fist to his face. The act of stopping her brought the pain of the magic. The Aegeal came up into his stomach. He rolled over on the ground, crying out in agony. Stand up! Richard choked off the anger to shut away the pain of the magic. The pain of the Aegeal didn't fade so quickly. He came to his feet with great difficulty. Now, get on your knees and ask for my forgiveness. When he didn't move quick enough for her, she laid the Aegeal on his shoulder, pushing him down with it. His right arm went numb with hurt. Please, Mistress Denna, forgive me. That's better. She smiled at last. Stand up. She watched him come to his feet. You have your sword and knife because they are no danger to me, and perhaps someday you will use them to protect your mistress. I prefer my pets to keep their weapons so it can be a constant reminder that they are helpless against me. She turned her back to him, removing her glove. Richard knew she was right about the sword. It had magic, and she controlled that but he wondered if that was the only way. He had to know. His hands reached for her throat. 
She continued to slowly remove the glove as he fell to his knees, crying out with the pain of the magic. Desperately, he brought his mind to the picture of the Heartland Woods. The pain eased, and he returned to his feet when she told him to do so. Denna gave an impatient look. You're going to make this hard, aren't you? Her face softened, the smooth smile returning. But then I enjoy it when a man makes it hard. Now you're doing it wrong. I told you that to make the pain stop, you should think something pleasant about me. That's not what you're doing. You're thinking about some boring trees. This is your last warning. Either think something pleasant about me to stop the pain of the magic, or I will leave you in the agony of it all night. Do you understand? Yes, Mr. Stenna. Her smile widened. That was very good. See? You can be trained. Just remember, something pleasant about me. She took his hands and gazed into his eyes as she pressed his hands to her breasts. I find most men seem to focus their pleasant thoughts here. She leaned closer, still holding his hands against her, her voice becoming airy. But if there's anything you like better... Please feel free to let your mind go there instead. Richard decided that he thought her hair was pretty, and that that was the only place on her his mind was going to go to think anything pleasant. The pain unexpectedly took him to his knees, tightening its grip until he couldn't breathe. His mouth opened, but he could get no air. His eyes bulged. Now, show me you can do as you were told. Shut the pain off any time you wish, but do it in the way I told you. He looked up at her at her hair. His vision was blurring. With concentration, he thought about how attractive he thought her braid was. He forced himself to think of it as beautiful. The pain lifted, and he collapsed to his side, gasping for air. Stand up. He did as he was told, still struggling to breathe. That was the proper way to do it. See to it, that is the only way you dare to remove the pain in the future, or I will change the magic so you will be unable to remove it at all. Understand? Yes, Mistress Denna. He was still catching his breath. Mistress Denna, you said someone betrayed me. Who was it? One of your own. None of my friends would do that. Mistress Denna. She regarded him contemptuously. Then I would guess they aren't really your friends now, are they? He looked at the floor, a lump in his throat. No, Mistress Denna. But who was it? She shrugged. Master Rall didn't think it important enough to tell me. The only thing that is important for you to know now is that no one is going to rescue you. You are never going to be free again. The sooner you learn that, the easier it will go for you, the easier your training will be. And what is the purpose of my training, Mistress Denna? The smile returned to her face. To teach you the meaning of pain to teach you that your life is no longer yours, that it is mine, and I can do anything I want with it. Anything. I can hurt you in any way I want for as long as I want, and no one is going to help you but me. I'm going to teach you that every moment you have without pain is a moment only I can grant you. You are going to learn to do as I say, without question, without hesitation, no matter what it is. You are going to learn to beg for anything you get. After a few days of training here, and I think you have made enough progress, then I will take you to another place, where there are other moored Sith, and I will continue training you there until I'm finished, no matter how long it takes. I will let some of the other moored Sith play with you, so you can see how lucky you are to have me. I rather like men. Some of the others hate them. I will let some of them have you for a while, so you can see how gentle I really am. And what is the purpose of this training, Mistress Denna? To what end? What is it you want? She seemed to genuinely enjoy telling him these things. You are someone special. Master Rall himself wants you trained. Her smile widened. He asked for me. I would guess he has something he wants to ask you. I will not let you embarrass me in his eyes. When I'm done with you, you will beg to tell him anything he wants to know. When he is finished with you, then you are to be mine for life, however long that may be. 
Richard had to concentrate on her hair, had to fight to keep the anger down. He knew what Dark and Rahl wanted to know. He wanted to know about the Book of Counted Shadows. The box was safe. Kalin was safe. Nothing else mattered. Dana could kill him for all he cared. In fact, it would be doing him a favor. Dana walked around him, looking him up and down. If you prove to be a good pet, I may even choose you for my mate. She stopped in front of him, put her face close to his, gave him a coy smile. Mord Sith, mate for life. Her smile showed her teeth. I've had many mates. But don't get yourself too excited by the prospect, my pet, she breathed. I doubt you will find it to be an experience you enjoy if you live through it. None of the others have. They all died after a short time as my mate. Richard didn't think that was anything he had to worry about. Dark and Rahl wanted the book. If he didn't find a way to escape, Dark and Rahl was going to kill him in the same way he had killed Richard's father and Giller. The most he would learn from reading Richard's entrails was where that place was, inside Richard's head, and there was no way any amount of the reading of his entrails was going to read the book out to him. Richard only hoped he could live long enough to see the look of surprise on Dark and Rahl's face when he realized he had made a fatal mistake. No book, no box. Dark and Rahl was a dead man. That was all that mattered. As for the question of him being betrayed, he decided that he didn't believe it. Dark and Rahl knew the wizard's rules, and he was just using the first, trying to make him afraid of the possibility. The first step to believing. Richard decided that he was not going to be tricked by the wizard's first rule. He knew Zed and Chase and Kalin. He would not believe Dark and Rahl over his friends. By the way, where did you get the Sword of Truth? He looked right into her eyes. I bought it from the last man that had it. Mr. Stenna, is that so? What did you have to give for it? Richard held her eyes. Everything I had. It would appear it is to also cost me my freedom and probably my life. Denna laughed. You have spirit. I love breaking a man with spirit. Do you know why Master Rahl picked me? No, Mr. Stenna. Because I am relentless. I may not be as cruel as some of the others, but I enjoy breaking a man more than any of them. I love hurting my pets more than anything else in life. I live to do it. She arched an eyebrow and smiled. I don't give up, I don't tire of it, and I don't ease up, ever. I am honored, Mistress Denna, to be in the hands of the best. She put the Aegeal against the cut on his lip and held it there until he was on his knees and tears ran from his eyes. That is the last flippant thing I ever want to hear from you. She took the Aegeal away and kneed him in his mouth, knocking him sprawling on his back. She pressed the Aegeal against his stomach. Before he passed out, she pulled it away. What do you have to say? Please, Mistress Denna, he managed with the greatest of effort. Forgive me. All right, get up. It's time to begin your training. She went to the table and retrieved something. She pointed to a spot on the floor. Stand there, now. Richard moved as fast as he could. He couldn't straighten himself. The pain wouldn't allow it. He stood on the spot, breathing hard, sweating. She handed him something with a thin chain attached. It was a collar made of leather, the same color as she wore. Her voice lost its pleasant quality. Put it on. Richard was in no condition to ask questions. He realized that he was starting to believe he would do anything to avoid the touch of the Aegeal. He buckled the collar around his neck. Denna picked up the chain. The end of it had a loop of metal, which she slipped over the post on the back of the wooden chair. The magic will punish you for going against my wishes. When I place this chain somewhere, it is my wish for it to stay there until I remove it. I want you to learn that you are helpless to remove it. She pointed at the door, which stood open. For the next hour, I want you to try your best to make it to that doorway. If you don't try your hardest, this is what I will do for the rest of the hour. She put the Aegeal to the side of his neck until he was on his knees, screaming in agony and begging for her to stop. She took it away and told him to begin, then went to lean, arms folded, against a wall. The first thing he did was simply to try to walk to the door. 
the pain buckled his legs before he was able to put even a little tension on the chain and stopped only when he scooted backward toward the chair. Richard reached for the ring. The pain of the magic cramped his arms until he was shaking with the strain of reaching for it. Sweat ran off his face. He tried backing to the chair, then turning, but before his fingers could touch the chain, the pain took him to the ground again. He pushed against the pain, straining to reach the chair, but couldn't get there past the pain, the effort causing him to fall to the ground, vomiting blood. When it ended, he held himself up with one hand, tears dripping from his face as he held his stomach with his other hand and shook. From the corner of his eye, he saw Denna unfold her arms and stand up straight. He started moving again. What he was doing was clearly not going to work. He had to think of something else. He drew the sword, thinking to lift the chain. For a brief instant, and with the greatest effort, he managed to touch the chain with the blade. The pain made him drop the sword. He was able to stop the hurt only by putting the sword back in its scabbard. A thought came to him. He lay down on the ground and with a quick movement kicked the chair out from under the chain before the pain could paralyze him. The chair skidded across the floor, hit the table and fell over. The chain fell from the post. The victory lasted only the briefest of moments. With the chain off the chair, the pain elevated to a new height. He choked and gasped against the floor. With all his effort, he clawed his way across the stone. Every inch he moved only increased the pain until he was blinded by it. His eyes felt as if they would explode from his head. He had managed to move only about two feet. He didn't know what to do. The pain wouldn't let him move, and it was keeping him from thinking. Please, Mistress Denna, he whispered with all his strength. Help me. Please help me. He realized he was crying but didn't care. He only wanted the chain back on the chair so the pain would stop. He heard her boots walking toward him. She bent and picked up the chair, righted it, and replaced the loop. His pain lifted, but he couldn't stop crying as he rolled onto his back. She stood over him with her hands on her hips. That was only 15 minutes. But since I had to come help you, the hour starts over. The next time I have to come help you, it will be two hours. She bent and pushed the Aegeal against his stomach, making pain bloom inside him. Understand? Yes, Mistress Denna, he cried. He was afraid there was a way to escape, and afraid of what would happen to him if he found it, and afraid of not trying. If there was a way, by the end of the hour, he had not found it. She came and stood over him as he rested on his hands and knees. Do you think you understand now? Do you understand what will happen if you try to escape? Yes, Mistress Denna. And he really did. There was no way for him to ever get away. Hopelessness closed around him, feeling as if it would suffocate him. He wanted to die. He thought about the knife at his belt. Stand up. As if reading his mind, she spoke softly. If you should think, you would end your service as my pet. Think again. The magic will prevent it. The same as it prevents you from moving the chain from where I put it. Richard blinked numbly at her. There is no way for you to escape me, not even through death. You will be mine as long as I choose to let you live. That won't be long, Mistress Denna. Dark and Rahl is going to kill me. Perhaps, but even if he does, it will only be after you tell him what he wants to know. What I want is for you to answer his questions. And you are going to do what I want without hesitation. Her brown eyes had the hardness of steel. You may not believe that right now, but you have no idea how good I am at training people. I have never failed to break a man. You may think you will be the first, but you will soon be begging to please me. The first day with her wasn't over, and already Richard knew he would do almost anything she said. She had weeks left to train him. If he could have willed himself to die on the spot, he would have done it. The worst thing was knowing she was right. There was nothing he could do to stop her. He was at her mercy, and he didn't think she had a shred of it. I understand, Mistress Denna. I believe you. Her pleasant smile made him need to think of how pretty her braid was. Good. Now take off your shirt. Her smile widened at the puzzled look on his face and the way he started unbuttoning his shirt nonetheless. She held the Aegeal in front of his eyes. 
It's time to teach you all the things the Aegeal can do. If you leave your shirt on, it will be covered in blood, and I won't be able to find a fresh spot on you. You are going to see why the outfit I wear is this color. He pulled his shirt tail out. He was breathing hard in a near panic. But, Mr. Stenna, what have I done wrong? She cupped a hand to the side of his face with mock concern. Why, don't you know? He shook his head, swallowing back the lump at his throat. You have let yourself be captured by a moored Sith. You should have killed all my men with your sword. I think you could have done it. You were very impressive as far as you went. Then you should have used your knife or your bare hands to kill me while I was vulnerable, before I had control of your magic. You should have never given me the chance to take control of the magic from you. You should have never tried to use it against me. But why must you use the Aegeal on me now? She laughed. Because I want you to learn. Learn that I can do whatever I want and there is no way for you to stop me. You must learn that you are totally helpless and that if you enjoy any time without pain, it is only because I choose it, not you. The smile left her face. She went to the table, returned with manacles held with a length of chain. Now, you have a problem that annoys me. You keep falling down. We are going to fix that. Put these on. She threw them at him. He struggled to control his breathing as he latched each iron band to a shaking wrist. Denna dragged the chair over to a beam, made him stand under it. She stood on the chair to hook the chain to an iron peg. Stretch up, it doesn't reach yet. He had to stand on his toes and stretch before she could get it hooked. There, she smiled. Now we won't have any more problems with you falling down. Richard hung from the chain, trying to control his terror, the iron bands digging into his wrists because of his own weight. He knew there was nothing he could do to stop her before, but this was different. It amplified his helplessness, made him all the more aware that there was no way for him to fight back. Denna pulled on her gloves, walked around him several times, tapping the Aegeal against her hand, prolonging his anxiety. If only he had been killed trying to stop Dark and Rawl. That was a price he had been prepared to pay. This was different. This was death without dying, living death. He was not even to be allowed the dignity of fighting back. He knew what the Aegeal felt like. He didn't need her to show him anymore. She was only doing this to take away his pride, his self-respect, to break him. Denna tapped the Aegeal against his chest and back as she continued walking around him. Each touch of it was like a dagger knifing into him. Each touch made him cry out in pain and twist on the chain. And he knew she hadn't even really begun yet. The first day was still not over, and there would be many more to come. He cried at his helplessness. Richard imagined his sense of self, his dignity as a living thing, saw it in his mind. He imagined a room, a room that was impervious to anything to any harm. He put his dignity, his self-respect, into that room and locked the door. No one would have a key to that door. Not Denna, not Dark and Rahl. Only him. He would endure what was to come, for as long as it was to come, without his dignity. He would do what he had to, and someday he would unlock the door and be himself again, even if it was only in death. But for now, he would be her slave. For now, but not always. Someday it would end. Denna took his face in both her hands and kissed him hard hard enough to make his cut lip throb and sting. She seemed to enjoy the kiss more when she was sure it hurt him. She took her face from his, her eyes wide with delight. Shall we begin, my pet? She whispered. Please, Mistress Denna, he whispered. Don't do this. Her smile widened. That's what I wanted to hear. Denna began showing him what the Aegeal would do, how if she dragged it lightly across his flesh, it raised fluid-filled welts, and how if she pressed a little harder, they filled with blood. When she bore down, he could feel warm wetness on his sweaty skin. She could also make the exact same pain without leaving a mark. His teeth hurt from gritting them so hard. Sometimes she would stand behind him, waiting until he was off guard before she touched it to him. When she tired of that, she made him close his eyes and keep them closed while she walked around him, pressing it against him or dragging it around his chest. She would laugh when she succeeded in making him think it was coming and he would brace for it, and it didn't. One particularly sharp jab brought his eyes open wide, giving her an excuse to use the glove. 
She made him beg for forgiveness for opening his eyes without being told to do so. His wrists bled from the manacles cutting into them. It was impossible to keep his weight off them. His anger only got away from him once when she pressed the Aegeal into his armpit. She stood with a smirk watching while he twisted, trying to think of her hair. Since putting the Aegeal there caused him to lose control of the anger, she concentrated on that area for a long time, but he didn't make the same mistake twice. Since he didn't bring on the pain of the magic again, she did it for him. Only when she did it, he couldn't turn it off no matter how hard he tried. He had to beg her to do it for him. Sometimes she would stand in front of him, watching him catch his breath. A few times she pressed herself against him, hugging his chest, squeezing, the hardness of the leather making every wound it pressed against flare anew in pain. Richard had no idea how long this torture lasted. Much of the time he wasn't aware of anything but the pain, as if it were a living thing there with him. He was only aware that at some point he knew he would do anything she said, no matter what it was, if only she would stop hurting him. He looked away from the Aegeal. The mere glimpse of it made tears well up in his eyes. Dana was right about herself. She never tired or became bored with what she did. It seemed to constantly fascinate her, keep her amused, satisfied. The only thing that seemed to make her happier than hurting him was when he begged her to stop. He would have begged more to make her happy, but most of the time he was incapable of talking. Simply breathing was almost more than he could handle. He no longer tried to keep the pressure off his wrists and hung limp, delirious. He thought she stopped for a while, but he hurt so much from what she had already done that he wasn't sure. The sweat in his eyes was blinding him. The sweat running into the wounds caused them to burn. When his head cleared somewhat, she returned, walking behind him. He braced for what he knew was coming. Instead, she grabbed a fistful of hair and jerked his head back. Now, my pet, I'm going to show you something new. I'm going to show you how kind a mistress I really am. She pulled his head back hard until the pain made him tense the muscles in his neck to resist the pressure. She put the Aegeal against his throat. Stop fighting me, or I won't take it away. Blood was running into his mouth. He relaxed his neck muscles, allowing her to pull as hard as she wanted. Now, my pet, listen very carefully. I'm going to put the Aegeal in your right ear. Richard almost choked with fear. She jerked his head back to make him stop it. It's different from putting it anywhere else. It hurts a lot more. But you must do exactly as I say. Her mouth was right by his ear. She whispered to him like a lover. In the past, when I have had a sister moored Sith with me, we would both put our Aegeal in the man's ears at the same time. He would make a scream unlike any other. The sound of it is intoxicating. I get chills just thinking about it. But it would also kill him. We were never successful at using two Aegeal at the same time in that particular way without killing him. We kept trying, but they always died. Be thankful I am your mistress. There are others who still try. Thank you, Mistress Denna. He wasn't sure what he was thanking her for, but he didn't want her to do whatever it was she had planned. Pay attention, she whispered harshly. Her voice softened again. When I do this, you must not move. If you move, it will damage things inside you. It won't kill you, but it will cause irrevocable disability. Some men who move go blind. Some are no longer able to move anything on one side of their body. Some can't talk anymore or walk. But in all who move, something is spoiled. I want you fully functional. Mord Sith who are more cruel than I don't tell their pets not to move. They just do it without warning them. So you see, I'm not so cruel as you thought. Still, only a few of the men I do it to are able to hold still. Even though I warn them, they still jerk, and then they are left impaired. Richard couldn't hold back from crying. Please, Mistress Denna, please don't do it. Please. He could feel the breath of her smile. She ran her wet tongue into his ear, kissed it. But I want to, my pet. Don't forget, hold still. Don't move. Richard clenched his teeth, but nothing could have prepared him for it. His head felt as if it had been turned to glass and shattered into a thousand pieces. His fingernails cut into his palms. All sense of time shattered apart with everything else. He was in a wasteland of agony with no beginning, no end. 
every nerve in his body seared with razor-sharp burning misery. He had no idea how long she held the Aegeal there, but when she took it away, his screams echoed from the stone walls. When he finally went limp, she kissed his ear and whispered breathlessly in it, That was a simply delightful scream, my pet. I've never heard one better. Except a scream in death, of course. You did very well, my pet. You never moved an inch. She kissed his neck tenderly, then his ear again. Shall we try the other side? Richard sagged in the shackles. He couldn't even cry. She pulled his head back harder as she moved to the other side of him. When she was finally finished with him and unhooked the chain, he collapsed to the floor. He didn't think himself capable of moving, but when she motioned him up with the Aegeal, the mere sight of it made him do as she wanted. That's all for today, my pet. Richard thought he might die of joy. I'm going to go get some sleep. Today was only a part day. Tomorrow we will get in a full day of training. You will find a full day more painful. Richard was too exhausted to care about tomorrow. He wanted only to lie down. Even the stone floor would feel like the best bed he had ever slept in. He looked at it longingly. Denna brought the chair over, took the chain that hung from his collar, and hooked it over the iron peg in the beam. He watched in confusion, too weary to try to figure out her intent. When finished, she walked toward the door. Richard realized there wasn't enough slack to allow him to lie down. Mistress Denna, how am I to sleep? She turned, gave him a condescending smile. Sleep? I don't recall telling you that you were allowed to sleep. Sleep is a privilege you earn. You have not earned it. Don't you remember this morning when you had that nasty vision of killing me with your sword? Don't you remember I told you that you would be sorry you did it? Good night, my pet. She started to leave but turned back. And if you have any thoughts of simply pulling the chain off the peg and letting the pain make you pass out, I wouldn't try it if I were you. I changed the magic. It will not allow you to pass out anymore. If you pull the chain off or fall down accidentally and that pulls it off, I will not be here to help you. You will be all alone for the night with the pain. Think about that if you get sleepy. She turned on her heels and left, taking the torch with her. Richard stood in the dark, crying. After a time, he forced himself to stop and thought of Kalin. That was something pleasant Denna couldn't take away from him, at least not tonight. He made himself feel good by thinking of how she was safe and had people to protect her. Zed and Chase and soon Michael's army. He envisioned her where she must be at a camp somewhere right now with Sidden and Rachel taking care of them, telling them stories, making them laugh. He smiled at the vision of her in his mind. He savored the memory of her kiss, the feel of her against him. Even if he wasn't with her, she could still make him smile, make him happy. What happened to him didn't matter. She was safe. That was all that counted. Kalen and Zed and Chase were safe, and they had the last box. Dark and Rahl was going to die, and Kalen was going to live. After it was over, what did it matter what happened to him? He might as well be dead. Denna or Dark and Rahl would see to that. He had only to endure the pain until then. He could do that. What did it matter? Nothing Denna could do could match the pain of knowing that he couldn't be with Kalen, the woman he loved. The woman he loved who would choose another. He was glad he was going to be dead before then. Maybe he could do something to hurry it along. It certainly didn't take much to make Denna angry. If he moved, the next time she put the Aegeal in his ear, he would be permanently impaired. Then maybe he would be of no use to her. Maybe she would kill him then. He had never felt so alone in his life. I love you, Kalen, he whispered into the dark. As Denna had promised, the next day was worse. She seemed well rested and anxious to work off some of her energy at the task of breaking him. He knew there was one thing he had control over, a choice in. He waited for her to use the Aegeal in his ear again so he could jerk his head with all his strength and cause serious damage. But she never did, as if she sensed what he might do. That gave him a shred of hope. It was something he had made her do. He had made her not use the Aegeal in that way. 
she didn't have all the control she thought she did, he still was able to force her to do something by his own choice. The thought heartened him. The thought of how he had locked his self-respect, his dignity away in his secret room gave him the ability to do what was necessary. He let himself do as she wished, when she wished it. The only time Denna paused was a few times to sit at the table to eat. She would watch him while she slowly ate fruit, smile to herself when he moaned. He was given nothing to eat, only water from a cup she held for him after she was finished with her meal. At the end of the day, she hooked his chain to the beam again and made him stand for the night. He didn't bother to ask why. It didn't matter. She was going to do as she wished, and there was nothing he could do to change it. In the morning, when she returned with the torch, he was still standing, but barely. She seemed in a good mood. I want a good morning kiss, she smiled. I expect you to return it. Show me how happy you are to see your mistress. He did his best, but had to concentrate on how pretty her braid was. The embrace ignited the flames of pain in the wounds she pressed against. When she was finished and the hurt left him shaking, she pulled the chain off the peg and tossed it on the floor. You are learning to be a good pet. You have earned two hours of sleep. He collapsed to the floor, asleep before the sound of her footsteps faded. He discovered that being awakened by the Aegeal was a terror all its own. The brief sleep had done little to revive him. He needed much more than he had been allowed. He vowed to himself that he would struggle with all his might to get through the entire day without making a single mistake, to do exactly as she wished, and maybe she would grant him a whole night's sleep. He put all his effort into doing everything she wished, hoping he would please her. He was hoping, too, that he would be given something to eat. He hadn't eaten since she had captured him. He wondered which he wanted more, sleep or food. He decided that what he wanted the most was for the pain to stop, or for him to be allowed to die. He was at the end of his strength, felt his life slipping away from him, and awaited the end with longing. Denna seemed to sense his waning endurance and eased up, giving him more time to recover, taking longer breaks. He didn't care. He knew it was never going to end. He was lost. He surrendered his will to live, to go on, to hold out. She cooed to him soothingly, stroked his face as he hung in the shackles, resting. She spoke encouragingly to him, told him not to give up, and promised that when he was broken it would be better. He just listened, not even able to cry. When at last she unhooked the shackles from the beam, he thought it must be night again. He had no sense of time anymore. He waited for her to hook up the chain, or throw it on the floor and tell him he could sleep. She did neither. She instead hooked it over the chair, told him to stand, and left. When she returned, she was carrying a bucket. On your knees, my pet. She sat in the chair next to him, took a brush from the hot soapy water, and started scrubbing him. The stiff bristles brought a pain all of their own as they worked into his wounds. We have a dinner invitation. I have to get you cleaned up. I rather like the smell of your sweat, your fear, but I'm afraid it would offend the guests. She worked with an odd sort of tenderness. It reminded him of the way a person would care for a dog. He fell against her, unable to hold himself up. He wouldn't lean against her for support if he had the strength not to, but he didn't. She let him stay where he was as she scrubbed. He wondered who the dinner invitation was from, but didn't ask. Denna told him anyway. Queen Milena herself has asked us to join her and her guests for dinner. Quite an honor for someone as low as you, wouldn't you say? He only nodded, not having enough strength to speak. Queen Milena. So they were in her castle. He guessed that didn't surprise him. Where else would she have had time to take him? When she was finished, she allowed him one hour of sleep to rest for dinner. He slept at her feet. She woke him with her boot instead of the Aegeal. He almost cried at her mercy and heard himself thanking her profusely for her kindness to him. She gave him instructions as to his behavior. He would have his chain hooked to her belt and was to keep his eyes to her, speak to no one unless they spoke to him first, and then only if he looked to her first for permission to answer. He would not be allowed to sit at the table, but would sit on the floor, and if he behaved himself, he would be given something to eat. He promised to do as she wished. The idea of sitting on the floor sounded wonderful to him, to be able to rest and not have to stand or be hurt, and to be allowed something to eat at last. He would make sure he did nothing to displease her or to keep her from giving him food. 
Richard's brain was in a fog as he followed behind Denna, attached to her by the chain on his collar, concentrating on keeping the proper amount of slack. The manacles were off his wrists, but the cuts from them were red and swollen and throbbed painfully. He vaguely remembered some of the rooms they passed through. In the room with other people, Denna stopped as she strode around, talking briefly with finely dressed people. Richard kept his eyes on her braid. The braid had obviously been done over for the dinner. The vigorous use of the Aegeal caused it to loosen and freed stray wisps of hair. She must have done it over while she had let him sleep. He found himself thinking about how beautiful her hair really was, how much finer she looked than any of the other women at the dinner. He knew people were staring at him, at his sword, as he was led around the room by his collar and chain. He reminded himself that his pride was locked away for the time being. This was about getting a chance to rest, to eat, and about having her not hurt him for a while. Richard bowed and stayed bowed while Denna spoke to the queen. The queen and the moored Sith gave only a bow of the head to each other. The princess was at the queen's side. Richard thought about how Princess Violet had treated Rachel and had to return his thoughts to Denna's braid. As she sat at the table, Denna snapped her fingers and pointed at the floor behind her chair. He knew what she wanted and sat on the floor, crossing his legs. Denna sat to the left of the queen, to the right of Princess Violet, who eyed him coldly. Richard recognized some of the queen's advisers. He smiled to himself. The court artist wasn't among them. The head table was higher than the others, but sitting on the floor, Richard couldn't see many of the gathered guests. Since you don't eat meat, the queen said to Denna, I had the cooks prepare a special dinner I know you will enjoy, some wonderful soups and vegetables and some rare fruits. Denna smiled and thanked her. While she was eating, a server brought her a plain bowl on a tray. For my pet, she told him, interrupting her conversation only briefly. The man took the bowl from the tray and handed it down to Richard. It was some sort of gruel, but to Richard, as he held the bowl in his trembling hands, preparing to drink it down, it looked like the best meal he had ever seen. If he's your pet, Princess Violet said, why do you allow him to eat like that? Denna looked over to the princess. What do you mean? Well, if he's your pet, the princess smiled, he should eat off the floor without his hands. Denna grinned, a glint in her eye. Do as she says. Put it on the floor, Princess Violet said, and eat it like a dog for us all to see. Let everyone see that the seeker is no better than a dog. Richard was too hungry to do anything to lose his meal. He concentrated on a mental image of Denna's braid and set the bowl carefully on the floor as he glanced into Princess Violet's eyes to her smirk and ate the gruel to the sound of laughter. He licked the bowl clean, telling himself it was because he needed the strength in case he ever got the chance to use it. After the queen and her guests had finished eating, a man in chains was brought in and made to stand in the center of the room. Richard recognized him. He was one of the men Kalin had freed from the dungeon. They exchanged a brief look of understanding, despair. There was talk of crimes and foul deeds done. Richard did his best to ignore it. He knew it was merely a pretext. The queen gave a short lecture on the man's crimes, then turned to the princess. Perhaps the princess would like to pronounce this man's punishment. Princess Violet stood, beaming. For his crimes against the crown, one hundred lashes. Then for his crimes against the people, his head. A murmur of agreement swept the room. Richard felt sick, but at the same time he wished he could exchange places with the man. The one hundred lashes would be easy, and there would be an axe at the end of it. Princess Violet turned to Denna as she sat back down. Sometime I would enjoy seeing how you handle your punishments. Stop down any time you wish. Denna glanced over her shoulder. I'll let you watch. When they were back in the stone room, Denna wasted no time in getting his shirt off, and he was soon hanging from the beam again. She coolly informed him that his eyes had strayed too much at dinner. Richard's heart sank. The shackles around his wrists burned into his flesh once more. Denna's talents had him covered in sweat in no time, gasping for air, crying out in agony. She told him it was still early, and she wanted to get in a lot of training before the evening ended. Richard's muscles flexed and tightened, lifting him off the floor as Denna twisted the Aegeal into his back. He begged her to stop, but she didn't. When he sagged once more in the shackles, he saw a silhouette in the doorway. 
I like the way you can make him beg, Princess Violet said. The Morn Sith smiled to her. Come closer, my dear, and I'll show you more. Denna hugged him with one arm, pressing herself into his wounds. She kissed his ear and whispered to him, Let's show the princess how well you can beg, shall we? Richard vowed to himself he wouldn't, but it wasn't long before he broke his vow. Denna put on a demonstration for Princess Violet, showing her the different ways she could hurt him. She seemed proud to show off her talents. Can I try? the princess asked. Denna looked down at her a moment. Why, of course, my dear, I'm sure my pet wouldn't mind. She smiled at him. Now would you? Please, Mistress Denna, don't let her, please. She's just a little girl. I'll do anything you say, but don't let her, please. There, you see, my dear, he doesn't mind at all. Denna handed her the Aegeal. Princess Violet stood grinning up at him while she fingered the Aegeal. Experimentally, she poked it at his thigh muscle, happy at the way it made him flinch in pain. Pleased with the results, she walked around him, poking it into his flesh. It's easy, she said. I never thought it would be this easy to make someone bleed. Denna stood with her arms folded across her breasts, watching him with a smile while the princess became bolder. It wasn't long before her cruelty came fully to the surface. She delighted in her new game. Remember what you did to me? She asked him. She jabbed the Aegeal into his side. Remember how you embarrassed me? I guess you're getting what you deserve, don't you think? Richard kept his teeth clenched tightly together. Answer me! Don't you think this is what you deserve? Richard kept his eyes closed as he tried to control his grip on the pain. Answer me and then beg me to stop. I want to do it while you beg. You better answer her, Denna said. She seems to learn fast. Please, Mistress Denna, don't teach her this. What you are doing to her is worse than what you are doing to me. She's only a little girl. Please don't do this to her. Don't let her learn these things. I'll learn what I please. You better start begging right now. Even though he knew he was only making it worse for himself, Richard waited until he could absolutely bear it no longer before he let himself answer. I'm sorry, Princess Violet, he gasped. Please forgive me. I was wrong. Richard found that answering her was a mistake. It only seemed to excite her. It didn't take her long, though, before she learned to make him beg and cry, even though he tried not to. Richard couldn't believe the absurdity of a little girl doing this, much less enjoying it. This was madness. She held the Aegeal against his stomach while she leered up at him. But this is less than that confessor deserves. She will get more than this some day, and I'm going to be the one to do it. My mother said I get to be the one when she comes back. I want you to beg me to hurt her. Let's hear you beg me to chop off the mother confessor's head. Richard had no idea what it was, but something inside him came awake. Princess Violet gritted her teeth and jammed the Aegeal into his gut hard as she could, twisting it. Beg me! Beg me to kill that ugly Kalen! The pain made Richard scream at the top of his lungs. Denna stepped between them, snatching the Aegeal from Princess Violet's hand. Enough. You will kill him if you use the Aegeal in that way. Thank you, Mistress Denna, he panted. He felt a peculiar affection for her at the way she stepped to his defense. Princess Violet took a step back, her face a picture of bad temper. I don't care if I kill him. Denna's voice was cool and authoritative. Well, I do. He is too valuable to waste in this manner. Denna was clearly the one in charge around here, not the princess, not even the queen. Denna was an agent of Dark and Rahl. Princess Violet glared at him. My mother says that Confessor Kalin will come back and that we'll have a surprise for her the next time she comes here. I just want you to know, because my mother said you'll be dead by then. My mother says I get to decide what to do to her. First, I'm going to cut off her hair. Her hands were in fists, her face red. Then I'm going to let all the guards rape her, every one. Then I'm going to put her in the dungeon for a few years so they'll have someone to play with. Then when I get tired of hurting her, I'll have her head chopped off and put it on a pole where I can watch it rot. Richard actually felt sorry for the little princess. The sadness for her came over him in a wave. At that feeling, he was surprised to feel the thing in him that had come awake rise up. Princess Violet squeezed her eyes shut, 
stuck her tongue out far as she could. It was like a red flag. The strength of the awakened power exploded through him. He could feel her jaw shatter like a crystal goblet on a stone floor when his boot came up under it. The impact of the blow lifted the princess into the air. Her own teeth severed her tongue before they too shattered. She landed on her back a good distance away, trying to scream through the gushing blood. Denna's eyes snapped to him. For an instant, he saw fear pass across them. Richard had no idea how he was able to do what he had done, why the magic hadn't stopped him, and from the look on Denna's face, he knew he shouldn't have been able to do it. I warned her before, Richard said, holding Denna's glare. Promise made, promise kept. He smiled. Thank you, Mistress Denna, for saving my life. I owe you. She stared at him a moment before her expression turned dark. She stalked out of the room. He watched the princess writhing on the floor as he hung in the shackles. Turn over, Violet, or you'll drown in your own blood. Turn over. The princess managed to flip herself over, a red pool spreading under her. Men appeared in a rush, tending to her. Denna watched. They lifted her carefully, carrying her away. He could hear their urgent voices fading, disappearing down the hall. And then he was alone with Denna. The strap hinges creaked as she pushed the door closed with one long nailed finger. Richard had learned over the last few days that Denna truly did have a perverse kindness to her. He had learned to interpret the way she used the Aegeal to interpret her mood through it. Sometimes, when she was hurting him, he could tell she was holding back out of a twisted caring for him. He knew it was insane, but he understood that there were times she felt she was sharing her feelings for him by doing her worst. He knew, too, that tonight she was going to do her worst. She stood by the door, watching him. Her voice was soft. You are a very rare person, Richard Cipher. Master Rahl warned me about you warned me to take care that the prophecies speak of you. She walked slowly, her boots echoing her steps on the stone to stand in front of him, close. She looked into his eyes, a slight wrinkle to her brow. Her breath on his face was quicker than normal. That was quite extraordinary, she whispered, thoroughly exciting. Her eyes searched his face hungrily. I have decided, she said breathlessly, to have you as my mate. Richard hung from the chains, helpless against this madness. He didn't know what the power was that had risen up in him, or how to call it back. He tried. It did not come. Dennis seemed to be in the grip of something he didn't understand, as if she were trying to summon the courage to do something, fearing it, yet anxiously wanting it. Her breathing was quickening, her chest heaving, as she looked into his eyes. Incredulous, he saw something the ugliness of her cruelty had never let him see before. She was attractive, breathtakingly, stunningly attractive. He thought he must be losing his mind. Shocked and strangely worried, Richard watched as she slowly put the Aegeal between her teeth. He could tell by the way her pupils suddenly expanded that it was hurting her. Her skin paled. She inhaled sharply, trembling the slightest bit. Denna put her fingers into the back of his hair and held his head. Slowly she brought her lips to his. She kissed him deeply, passionately, sharing the shattering pain of the Aegeal with him. With her tongue, she held it between their lips. Her kiss was savage, bestial, as she twisted against him. Page 470. Every fiber of his being burned with the torture. His gasp sucked the air from her lungs. Hers did the same to him. He could get no breath but hers. She, none but his. The pain made him forget everything but her. It marauded through his mind. He knew by the sounds she was making that she was feeling the same agony as he. Her fingers in his hair tightened into fists from the pain. She moaned in suffering. Her muscles tightened with it. It raged through the both of them. Without comprehending why, he found himself kissing her back just as passionately, just as savagely. The pain was altering his perception of everything. He had never kissed anyone with this kind of lust. Desperately, he wanted her to stop. Desperately, he didn't. The strange power awakened again. He tried to reach for it, grasp for it, hold on to it. But it slipped from him again and was gone. The pain was overwhelming him as Denna crushed her lips to his, the Aegeal between them, their teeth grating together. 
She pressed her body to his, hooked a leg around his, clung to him. Her cries of anguish were growing more desperate. He ached to hold her. As he was about to lose consciousness, she pulled away from him, still gripping his hair in her fists. Tears ran from her eyes as she looked into his, not two inches away. She rolled the Aegeal into her mouth with her tongue and held it there with her teeth as she shook with the pain, as if to show him she was stronger than he. Her hand came slowly and took the Aegeal as her eyes rolled back in her head. She gasped for air. Her brow wrinkled together. Tears from the pain and from something else flooded from her eyes. She gave him a kiss. The tenderness, the gentleness of it shocked him. We are bonded, she whispered intimately. Bonded in the pain of the Aegeal. I am sorry, Richard. She brushed his cheek with trembling fingers, the glaze of pain still in her eyes. Sorry for what I will do to you. You are my mate for life. Richard was stunned by the compassion in her voice. Please, Mistress Denna, please let me go, or at least help me stop Dark and Rahl. I promise you I will willingly be your mate for life if you help me stop him. I swear on my life if you help me. I will stay without the magic holding me, forever. She put a hand to his chest to steady herself as she recovered. Do you think I do not understand what I am going to do to you? Her eyes had an empty gloss to them. Your training and service will last for mere weeks before you die. The training of a moored Sith lasts for years. Everything I do to you and more has been done to me a thousand times over. A moored Sith must know her Aegeal better than she knows herself. My first trainer took me for his mate when I was fifteen, after he had trained me since I was twelve. There is no way I could ever live up to his cruelty or his ability to keep a person on the cusp between life and death. He trained me until I was eighteen, when I killed him. For that, I was punished with the Aegeal every day for the next two years. This Aegeal. The very same one I use on you was the one used to train me. It was presented to me when I was proclaimed Mord Sith. I live for nothing else but to use it. Mistress Denna, he whispered, I'm sorry. The steel returned to her eyes. She nodded. You will be. There is no one who will help you. That includes me. You will find that being the mate to a moored Sith brings you no added privileges, only a great deal of added pain. Richard hung helpless in the shackles, overwhelmed by the enormity of it all. Understanding her a little only increased his hopelessness. There was no escape for him. He was the mate of a madwoman. The frown and the smile returned. Why would you be so foolish as to do what you did? Surely you must know I will hurt you for doing it. He looked at her puzzlement for a moment. Mistress Denna, what difference does it make? You were going to hurt me anyway. I can't imagine what more you could do to me. Her lip curled in a sneer. Oh, my love, you have a very limited imagination. He felt her grab the tongue of his belt and yank the buckle open. She gritted her teeth. It is time we found some new places on you to hurt. It is time to see what you are really made of. The look in her eyes made him go cold. Thank you, my love, for giving me the excuse to do this to you. I have never before done it to another, but it has been done to me enough times. It is what broke me when I was fourteen. Tonight, she whispered, neither of us is going to get any sleep. Chapter 42 the bucketful of cold water on his naked flesh barely revived him. He only dimly saw the little rivers of water that were stained bright red as they ran away from him in the cracks of the stone floor his face lay against. Each shallow breath he took was a mighty effort. He wondered idly how many of his ribs she had broken. Put your clothes on. We're leaving, she called down to him. Yes, Mistress Denna, he whispered, his voice so hoarse from screaming he knew she couldn't hear him and knew she would hurt him for not answering, and yet he could do no more. When the Aegeal didn't come, he moved a little, saw his boot, and reached out to it, pulling it to him. He sat up but couldn't raise his head above his shoulders. It hung limply. With great difficulty, he started putting on his boot. 
Gashes on his feet brought tears to his eyes when he pulled. Her knee to his jaw knocked him flat on his back. She fell on him, sitting on his chest, hitting his face with her fists. What's the matter with you? Are you stupid? Your pants go on before your boots. Do I have to tell you everything? Yes, Mr. Stenner. No, Mr. Stenner. Forgive me, Mr. Stenner. Thank you, Mr. Stenner, for hurting me. Thank you, Mr. Stenner, for teaching me, he mumbled. She sat on his chest, panting in rage. Her breathing slowed after a time. Come on, I will help you. She leaned over and kissed him. Come on, my love. You'll be able to rest while we travel. Yes, Mr. Stenna. The sound of his voice was hardly more than a breath. She kissed him again. Come on, my love. It will be better now that I have broken you. You will see. A closed carriage stood waiting for them in the dark. Clouds from the horse's breath rose and drifted slowly in the cold, still air. Richard stumbled a few times as he walked behind her, trying to keep the proper slack to the chain. He had absolutely no idea how long it had been since she had decided he was to be her mate, nor did it matter to him. A guard opened the carriage door. Denna tossed the end of his chain on the floor. Get in. Richard grabbed the sides of the door. He dimly heard someone approach in a huff. Denna gave a little tug to the chain, indicating she wanted him to wait where he was. Denna! It was the queen at the head of her advisors. Mistress Denna, she corrected. The queen looked to be in a foul mood. Where do you think you are going with him? That is none of your concern. It is time we are on our way. How is the princess? The queen glowered. We don't know if she will live. I will be taking the seeker. He is to pay. The seeker is the property of myself and of Master Rahl. He is being punished and will continue to be punished until either Master Rahl or myself kills him. There is nothing you could do to him that could equal what is already being done. He is to be executed right now. Denna's voice was as cold as the night air. Go back to your castle, Queen Melena, while you still have a castle. Richard saw a knife in the queen's hand. The guard standing next to him unhooked his battle axe, gripping it tightly in his fist. There was a crystal clear moment of silence. The queen backhanded Denna and lunged with the knife for Richard. Denna effortlessly caught her with the agile against her large chest. As the guard went past him, raising the axe to Denna, the strange power roared awake. Richard summoned all his strength, became one with the power. He hooked his left arm around the guard's throat and drove his knife home. Denna gave a casual glance back as the man let out a death scream. She smiled, and her eyes glided back to the queen, who stood shaking, paralyzed in place the Aegeal between her breasts. Denna gave a twist to the Aegeal. The queen dropped straight down in a heap. Denna turned her glare to the queen's advisors. The queen's heart has given out, she arched an eyebrow. Unexpectedly. Please express my condolence to the people of Tamarang on the death of their ruler. I would suggest you find a new ruler who is more attentive to the wishes of Master Rahl. They all gave a quick bow. The awakened power flickered and was gone. The effort of stopping the guard had taken all the strength Richard had left. His shaking legs would no longer hold him. The ground tilted and came up to meet him. Denna grabbed his chain near the collar, raising his head off the ground. I didn't tell you to lie down. You were not given permission. On your feet. He couldn't move. She drove the Aegeal into his stomach, dragged it up his chest to his throat. Richard convulsed in pain but could not make his body respond to her wishes. Sorry, he breathed. She let his head drop to the ground when she realized he wasn't able to move and turned to the guards. Put him inside. She climbed in after him, yelling up to the driver to be off, and pulled the door shut. Richard slumped back as the carriage jerked ahead. Please, Mistress Denna, he said in a slur. Forgive me for letting you down for failing to stand as you wished. I'm sorry. I will do better in the future. Please punish me to teach me to be better. She gripped the chain close to the collar, her knuckles white, lifting him from the seat back. Her lips curled in a sneer over gritted teeth. Don't you dare die on me now. Not yet. You have things to do first. His eyes were closed. As you command, Mistress Denna. She let go of the chain, took his shoulders, laid him across the seat, and gave him a kiss on his forehead. 
You have my permission to rest now, my love. It's a long way. You will have a long time to rest before it starts again. Richard felt her fingers smoothing his hair back and the bouncing of the carriage as it sped along the road and was asleep. From time to time, he came partly awake, never fully conscious. Sometimes Denna sat next to him, letting him lean against her as she spooned food into his mouth. Swallowing was painful, almost more effort than he could bring forth. He winced with each spoonful, his hunger not sufficient to overcome the pain in his throat, and he turned his head from the spoon. Denna murmured encouragement to him, urging him to eat for her. Doing it for her was the only thing he responded to. Whenever a bump in the road brought him awake suddenly, he would clutch at her for protection, safety, until she told him it was nothing and to go back to sleep. He knew that sometimes he slept on the ground, sometimes in the carriage. He saw nothing of the countryside they traveled through, nor did he care. As long as she was near him, that was all that mattered. Nothing else was important, except being ready to do as she commanded. A few times he slowly came awake to find her wedged into the corner with him stretched out, his cloak tucked around him, his head on her breast as she stroked his hair. When it happened, he tried not to let her know he was awake so she wouldn't stop. When this happened and he felt the warm comfort of her, he also felt the power in him come awake. He didn't try to reach it to hold it, he only noted it. One time when it happened, he recognized it, knew what it was. It was the magic of the sword. As he lay against her, feeling the need of her, the magic stood within him. He touched it, fondled it, felt its power. It was like the power he had called forth when he was going to kill with the sword, but different in a way he couldn't understand. The power he had known before, he could no longer feel. Denna had that power now, but this she didn't. When he tried to grasp the magic, it vanished like vapor. A dim part of his mind wanted its help, but since he couldn't control it, call it forth to aid him, he lost interest in it. As the time passed, his wounds began healing over. Each time he came awake, he was a little more alert. By the time Denna announced that they had arrived at their destination, he was able to stand by himself, although he was still not completely clear-headed. In the darkness, she led him from the carriage. He watched her feet as she walked, keeping the proper slack in the chain attached to her belt. Even though he kept his eyes on her, he still noticed the place they were entering. It was immense, dwarfing the castle at Tamarang. Walls stretched off into the nothingness of the distance. Towers and roofs rose to dizzying heights. He was aware enough to note that the design of the vast structure was elegant and graceful. It was imposing, but not harsh, not forbidding. Denna led him through halls of polished marble and granite. Columns held majestic arches to the sides. As they walked on and on, he noticed how his strength had grown. He wouldn't have been able to stand for this long even a few days ago. They saw no other people. Richard looked up at her braid and thought about how pretty her hair was, how lucky he was to have such a fine mate. At the thought of his caring for her, the power rose up. Before it had a chance to fade, the dim, locked-away part of his mind grabbed it, held it, while the rest of his mind thought about his affection for her. The realization that he had control of it made him stop thinking about her and grab the hope of escape. The power evaporated. His heart sank. What did it matter, he thought. He was never going to escape, and why would he want to anyway? He was Denna's mate. Where would he go? What would he do without her to tell him what to do? Denna went through a door, closing it behind him. A window with a pointed top was trimmed with simple drapes and opened to the darkness outside. There was a bed with a thick blanket and fat pillows. The floor was polished wood. Lamps stood lit on the table next to the bed, and on the table with a chair on the other side of the room. There were cabinets of dark wood built into one wall next to another door. A stand held a basin and pitcher. Denna unhooked his chain. These are my quarters. Since you are my mate, you will be permitted to sleep here if you please me. She hooked the loop over the post of the footboard, snapped her fingers, and pointed at the floor at the foot of the bed. You may sleep there tonight, on the floor. He looked at the floor. The Aegeal laid on the top of his shoulder took him to his knees. I said, on the floor, now. Yes, Mr. Stenna. I'm sorry, Mr. Stenna. I'm exhausted. I don't want to hear another sound out of you tonight. Understand? He nodded, afraid to voice his agreement. Good. She flopped face down in the bed and was asleep in moments. Richard rubbed the hurt in his shoulder. It had been a while since she had used the Aegeal on him. 
At least she hadn't chosen to draw blood. Maybe, he reasoned, she didn't want blood in her quarters. No, Denna liked his blood. He lay down on the floor. He knew that tomorrow she was going to hurt him some more. He tried not to think about it. He was just getting healed from before. He was awake before her. The shock of being awakened by the Aegeal was something he wanted to avoid. A bell rang with a long peal. Denna woke, lay on her back a while, saying nothing, then sat up, checking that he was awake. Morning devotions, she announced. That was the bell, the call. After devotions, you will be trained. Yes, Mistress Denna. She hooked his chain to her belt and led him once more through the halls to a square open to the sky with pillars supporting arches on all four sides. The center of the square, under the open sky, was white sand, raked in concentric lines around a dark pitted rock. On the top of the rock was a bell, the one he had heard before. On the tile floor, among the columns, were people on their knees bent forward, with their foreheads touching the tile. The people chanted in unison, Master Rall, guide us. Master Rall, teach us. Master Rall, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Over and over they chanted the same thing. Denna snapped her fingers, pointing at the floor. Richard kneeled down, imitating the others. Denna kneeled next to him, putting her forehead to the tiles. She started chanting in unison with the others, but stopped when she heard he wasn't. That's two hours, she frowned darkly at him. If I have to remind you again, it's six. Yes, Mistress Denna. He began chanting along. He had to concentrate on a vision of Denna's braid to be able to say the words without bringing on the pain of the magic. He wasn't sure how long the chanting lasted, but he thought it was about two hours. His back hurt from bending with his head to the floor. The words never varied. After a time, they melted into the sound of gibberish, feeling like mush in his mouth. The bell rang twice, and the people rose to their feet, going off in different directions. Denna rose. Richard stayed where he was, unsure of what to do. He knew he might get in trouble for staying where he was, but knew if he got up and wasn't supposed to, the punishment would be much worse. He heard footsteps coming toward them, but didn't look up. A woman's husky voice spoke. Sister Denna, how good to see you've returned. Tahara has been lonely without you. Tahara? Through the fog of his training, the word ignited his thoughts. Instantly, he brought to mind the vision of Denna's braid protecting him. Sister Constance, it's good to be home and see your face again. Richard recognized the ring of sincerity in Denna's voice. The Aegeal touched the back of his neck, taking his breath away. It felt as if a rope were tightening around his throat. By the way it was held, he knew it wasn't Denna's. And what have we here? Constance asked. She took the Aegeal away. Coughing in pain, Richard gasped for air. He came to his feet when Denna told him to do so, wishing he could hide behind her. Constance was a good head shorter than Denna. Her stout figure dressed in a leather outfit like Denna's, only brown. Her dull brown hair was done in a braid, too, but didn't have the fullness of Denna's. The look of her face made it seem she had just eaten something she didn't like. Denna gave his stomach an easy slap with the back of her hand. My new mate. Mate! Constance spat the word out as if it tasted bitter. I swear, Denna, I'll never understand how you can bear to take a mate. The thought of it gives me a stomach ache. So, the seeker I see by his sword. Quite a catch, anyway. It must have been difficult. Denna smiled smugly. He only killed two of my men before he turned his magic on me. The look of shock on Constance's face made Denna laugh. He's from Westland. Constance's eyebrows went up. No! She peered into Richard's eyes. Is he broken? Yes, Denna said, sighing. But he still gives me reason to smile. It's only the morning devotion, and already he's earned two hours. A grin spread on Constance's face. Mind if I come along? Denna gave her a warm smile. You know that anything that is mine is yours also, Constance. In fact, you will be my second. Constance seemed pleased and proud. Richard had to furiously think of Denna's braid as the edges of the anger burned to get away from him. Denna leaned closer to her friend. In fact, for you only... If you wish to borrow him for a night, I would not object. Constance stiffened with displeasure. 
Denna laughed. Never try, never know. Constance scowled. I will have my pleasure from his flesh in other ways. I'll go change into the red and meet you there. No, the brown is fine for now. Constance studied her face. That's not like you, Denna. I have my reasons. Besides, Master Rahl himself sent me for this one. Master Rahl himself? As you wish, then. After all, he is yours to do with as you will. The training room was a simple square with walls and floor of gray granite and a beamed ceiling. On the way in, Constance tripped him. He landed on his face. Before he could stop it, the anger gripped him. She stood over him, pleased with herself, watching him struggle to regain control. Denna attached a device to him that held his wrists and elbows tightly together behind his back. It was hooked to a rope that ran through a pulley in the ceiling and was tied off at the wall. She hoisted him up until he had to stand on his toes before she tied the rope off at the wall. The pain in his shoulders was excruciating, making it hard to breathe, and she hadn't even touched the Aegeal to him yet. He was helpless, off balance, and in agony before she even started. His mood sank. Denna sat in a chair against the wall, telling Constance to enjoy herself. When Denna had trained him, she often had a smile on her face. Constance never smiled once. She went about her work like an ox at a plow, strands of hair coming loose, and in no time her face was covered with a sheen of sweat. She never varied the touch of her Aegeal. It was always the same, always hard, harsh, angry. Richard didn't have to anticipate. There was no pause. She worked with rhythmic timing, never giving him a rest. But she didn't draw blood. Denna had a constant smile on her face as she sat with the chair leaned against the wall. At last, Constance stopped, Richard panting, groaning. He can take it well. I haven't had a workout like this in quite a time. All the pets I've gotten lately fold at the first touch. The chair came down on its front legs with a clunk. Maybe I can help, Sister Constance. Let me show you where he doesn't like it. Denna came up behind him and paused, making him flinch in expectation of what didn't come. Just as he breathed out, the Aegeal drove into a tender spot on the right side. He cried out as she held the pressure against him. He couldn't hold his weight, and the rope pulled his shoulders so hard he thought his arms would come out of their sockets. With a sneer, Denna held the Aegeal to him until he started crying. Please, Mistress Denna, he sobbed. Please! She withdrew the Aegeal. See? Constance shook her head. I wish I had your talent, Denna. Here is another place, she made him scream. And here, and here too. She came around and smiled to him. You don't mind if I show Constance all your special little places, do you? Please, Mistress Denna, don't. It hurts too much. There, you see? He doesn't mind at all. She went back to her chair as tears ran down his face. Constance never smiled. She simply went to work and also had him begging breathlessly. But the way she never varied the pressure, never let up, was worse than Denna. She never gave him a moment to rest. Richard learned to fear her touch more than he feared Denna's. Denna had an odd compassion at times. Constance never did. When it was beyond a certain point, Denna would tell her to stop, wait a moment, guide her so as not to cripple him. Constance complied with her wishes and let Denna direct the way she wanted him hurt. You don't have to stay, Denna, if you have things to do. I won't mind. Fear and panic raced through his mind. He didn't want to be left alone with Constance. He knew that Constance wanted to do things to him that Denna didn't want done. He didn't know what they were, but he feared them. Another time. I will leave you alone with him to do things your way, but today I will stay. Richard made sure he showed no sign that he was relieved. Constance went back to work. After a while longer, when she was behind him, Constance grabbed a fistful of his hair and yanked his head back, hard. Richard knew very well what it meant to have his head pulled back in this manner. He remembered the pain of what she was about to do, the pain of having the Aegeal in his ear. He shook uncontrollably, couldn't breathe with the fear of it. Denna came out of her chair. Don't do that, Constance. Constance gritted her teeth as she looked at him, pulling his head back harder. Why not? Surely you've done it. Yes, 
I just don't want you to, that's all. Master Rawl hasn't talked to him yet. I don't want to take any chances. A grin came to Constance's face. Dana, let's do it together. At the same time, you and me, like we used to. I told you, Master Rawl wants to talk to him. After that, Dana smiled. It has been a long time since I've heard that scream. She looked to Richard's eyes. If Master Rawl doesn't kill him, and he doesn't die first from... from other things, then yes, we will do it to him, all right? But not now. And Constance, please respect my wishes about using the Aegeal in his ear. Constance nodded and released his hair. Don't think you have gotten off easy. She scowled at him. Sooner or later, you and I will be alone, and then I will take my pleasure from you. Yes, Mistress Constance, he whispered hoarsely. After they were finished training him, they went to lunch. Richard followed behind, the chain hooked to Denna's belt. The dining hall was tasteful in its simple style of frame and panel oak over a white marble floor. There was the soft murmur of conversation at the various tables as people ate. Denna snapped her fingers as she sat, pointing at the floor behind her chair. Servers brought food to the two moored Sith, but none for Richard. Lunch was a hearty-looking soup, cheese, brown bread, and fruit. The good smells drove Richard to distraction. There was no meat served. Halfway through her meal, Denna turned and told him that he would get no lunch for having earned two hours that morning. She said that if he behaved himself, he would get dinner. The afternoon was spent at devotions, and after that, several hours of training. Denna and Constance shared the task. Richard did his best to do nothing wrong, and at dinner was rewarded with a bowl of rice with vegetables over it. After dinner were more devotions and more training, until at last they left Constance and returned to Denna's quarters, Richard dead tired, stooped with pain as he walked. I wish a bath, she said. She showed him the room adjoining hers. It was small, empty of everything except a rope holding the binding device from the ceiling, and a bathing tub in the corner. She told him the room was for training if he needed it on the spot and she didn't want blood in her room, and for when she wanted to leave him hanging all night. She promised him he would be spending a great deal of time in the little room. She had him drag the tub to the foot of her bed. He took the bucket from the tub and was instructed where to go for hot water. He was to speak to no one, even if spoken to, and he was to run there and back so her bath water wouldn't get cold before the tub was filled. She told him that if he didn't follow her instructions exactly while out of her sight, the pain of the magic would take him down, and if she had to come looking for him, he would be very sorry he had disappointed her. He swore his solemn oath to do as she commanded. The place where the hot water came from, a hot spring in a pool surrounded by white marble seats, was a goodly distance. He was sweating and exhausted by the time he had the tub filled. While she sat soaking in the tub, Richard scrubbed her back, brushed her hair out, and helped her wash it. Denna draped her arms over the sides of the tub, put her head back, and closed her eyes, relaxing while he knelt next to her in case she wanted anything. You don't like Constance, do you? Richard didn't know how to answer. He didn't want to say anything bad about her friend, but lying would get him punished, too. I am afraid of her, Mistress Denna. Denna smiled with her eyes still closed. Clever answer, my love. You aren't trying to be flip, are you? No, Mr. Stenna, I told you the truth. Good. You should be afraid of her. She hates men. Every time she kills one, she cries out the name of the man who first broke her, Rastin. Remember I told you about the man who broke me, took me for his mate, and that later I killed him? Before he broke me, he was Constance's trainer. His name was Rastin. It was he who broke her. Constance is the one who told me how I could kill him. I would do anything for her, and because I killed the man she hated so, she would do anything for me. Yes, Mistress Denna. But, Mistress Denna, please don't leave me alone with her. I suggest you be very attentive to your duties. If you are, and you do not earn too much time, I will remain when she is training you. You see? You see how lucky you are to have a kind mistress? Yes, Mistress Denna. Thank you for teaching me. You are a gifted teacher. She opened one eye as if to check his face for a trace of a smirk. There was none. 
Get me a towel and lay my night clothes on the table by the bed. Richard helped towel her hair dry. Denna didn't put on her night clothes, but lay back on the bed with her damp hair spread out on the pillow. Go blow out the lamp on the table over there. He went immediately and blew out the flame. Bring me the Aegeal, my love. Richard flinched. He hated it when she had him fetch the Aegeal. Touching it hurt. Fearing the result of hesitation more, he gritted his teeth and snatched it up, holding it in the open palms of his hands. The pain of it vibrated in his elbows and shoulders. He could hardly wait for her to take it. She had propped up the pillows against the headboard and was sitting up a little watching him. He let out a deep breath when she picked it out of his hand. Mistress Denna, why doesn't it hurt you to touch it? It does, same as you. It hurts me to touch it because it is the one used to train me. His eyes opened wide. You mean the whole time you hold it, it hurts you? The whole time you are training me? She nodded, rolling it in her fingers, looking away from his eyes for a second. She gave him a little frown and smile. There is rarely a time I am without pain of one kind or another. That is one reason the training of a moored Sith takes years, to learn to handle the pain. I guess it's also why only women are moored Sith. Men are too weak. The chain around my wrist allows me to let it hang. It doesn't hurt when it hangs by the chain. But while I use it on someone, it causes constant pain. I never knew. Richard's insides knotted in anguish. I'm sorry, Mistress Denna. I'm sorry it hurts you that you must suffer to teach me. Pain can bring pleasure all its own, my love. That's one of the things I'm teaching you. And it's time for another lesson. Her eyes glided up and down him. Enough talk. Richard recognized the look in her eyes, the quickening of her breathing. But, Mistress Denna, you've just bathed and I'm all sweaty. A small smile came to one side of her mouth. I like your sweat. With her eyes locked on his, she put the Aegeal between her teeth. The days passed with a numbing sameness. Richard didn't mind the devotions because he wasn't being trained, hurt. But he hated saying the words and had to concentrate on Denna's braid the whole of the time he chanted. Chanting the same thing hour after hour on his knees with his head against the floor tiles was hardly less onerous than the training. Richard found himself waking at night or in the morning chanting the words, Master Rall, guide us, Master Rall, teach us, Master Rall, protect us. In your light we thrive, in your mercy we are sheltered, in your wisdom we are humbled, we live only to serve, our lives are yours. Denna didn't wear the red anymore. Instead, she wore white leather. She told him it was a gesture that said he was broken, had been taken for a mate, and that to show her power over him she chose not to make him bleed. Constance didn't like it. It didn't make much difference to Richard. The Aegeal felt the same whether it drew blood or not. Constance was with Denna about half the time, occasionally going off to train a new pet. Constance became more and more insistent about being left alone with Richard, but Denna wouldn't permit it. Constance threw her all into his training. The more Richard saw of her, the more terrified he became of her. Denna smiled at him whenever she told Constance to take over. One day after the afternoon devotion, when Constance had gone off to train someone else, Denna took him back to the little room adjacent to her quarters for his afternoon training. She hoisted him up by the rope until he was hardly able to touch the floor. Mistress Denna, with your permission, would you allow Mistress Constance to do all my training from now on? His question had an effect he hadn't expected. It enraged her. She stared at him, her face turning a deep red, then she started hitting him with the Aegeal, driving it into him, screaming at him, telling him how worthless he was, how insignificant, how she was sick of his talking. Denna was strong, and she beat him with the Aegeal as hard as she could. It went on and on. Richard couldn't remember her being so angry, so severe, so cruel. Soon he couldn't remember anything, even where he was. He convulsed in pain. He couldn't say anything or beg her to stop or even breathe most of the time. She never slowed or let up. She just seemed to get angrier as she hurt him. He saw blood on the floor, a lot of blood. It was splattered all over her white leather. Her chest heaved with her effort, her rage. Her braid came loose. Denna grabbed his hair and yanked his head back. 
She gave him no warning. She drove the Aegeal in his ear harder than she ever had. She did it again and again. Time distorted into eternity. He no longer knew who he was, what was happening. He no longer tried to beg, to cry, to hold on. She stopped, standing next to him, panting in ire. I'm going to dinner. He felt the agony of the magic come on in him. He gasped, his eyes going wide. While I'm gone and I'm going to take my time, I'm leaving the pain of the magic on you. You will not be able to pass out or to stop it. If you let the anger get away from you, it will make the pain worse. And it will get away from you, I promise. She went to the wall and hoisted the rope up until his feet were off the floor. Richard cried out. His arms felt as if they would be torn out. Enjoy yourself. She turned on her heels and left. Richard balanced on the edge of sanity and madness, the suffering twisting in him, making him unable to control the anger as she had promised. The flames of his hurt consumed him. It was somehow worse that she wasn't there. He had never felt so alone, so helpless, and the pain wouldn't even let him cry. He could only gasp in agony. He had no idea how long he was left alone. He was aware only of suddenly dropping to the floor, then Dennis' boots to either side of his head as she stood over him. She turned off the pain of the magic, but his arms were still clamped helplessly behind his back, and the burning inferno of pain in his shoulders didn't extinguish. He cried against the blood on the floor as she stood over him. I told you before, she hissed through gritted teeth, you are my mate for life. He could hear her heavy breathing, the rage in her. Before I begin doing worse to you and you are no longer able to speak, I want you to tell me why you ask to have Constance train you instead of me. He coughed up blood, trying to speak. That is not the way to speak to me. On your knees, now. He tried to get to his knees, but with his arms behind his back, he was unable to. Denna took a fistful of his hair and pulled him up. Dizzy, he fell against her, his face against the wet blood on her belly. His blood. She pushed him away from her with the tip of the Aegeal against his forehead. That brought his eyes open. He looked up at her to answer. Denna backhanded him across the mouth. Look at the ground when you speak to me. No one gave you permission to look at me. Richard looked down at her boots. You're running out of time. Answer the question. Richard coughed up more blood. It ran down his chin, and he had to struggle to keep from vomiting. Because, Mistress Denna, he said hoarsely, I know it hurts you to hold the Aegeal. I know it hurts you to train me. I wanted Mistress Constance to do it, to spare you the pain. I don't want you to hurt. I know what it feels like to hurt. You have taught me. You have already been hurt enough. I don't want you to hurt anymore. I would rather have Mistress Constance punish me than have you be in pain. He strove to balance himself on his knees. There was a long silence. Richard stared at her boots and coughed a little struggling to breathe with the pain in his shoulders. The silence seemed as if it would never end. He didn't know what she was going to do to him next. I don't understand you, Richard Cipher, she said softly at last, the anger gone from her voice. The spirits take me. I don't understand you. She walked behind him, unhooked the device that held his arms, and walked out of the room without another word. He couldn't straighten out his arms properly and fell on his face. He didn't try to get up. He only cried against the bloody floor. After a time, he heard the bell calling them to the evening devotion. Denna came back in, squatted down next to him, put her arm gently around him, and helped him to his feet. We are not allowed to miss a devotion, she explained in a quiet voice, hooking the chain to her belt. The sight of his blood all over the white leather was shocking. There were strings of it across her face and in her hair. As they walked to the devotion, People who usually spoke to her averted their eyes and gave her wide passage. Kneeling with his head to the floor hurt his ribs, making it hard to breathe, much less chant. He didn't know if he was getting the words right, but Denna didn't correct him, so he just went on. How he stayed upright the whole time without tipping over, he didn't know. When the bell rang twice, Denna rose, but didn't help him. Constance appeared, a rare grin on her face. My, my, Denna, looks like you've been having fun. Constance backhanded him, but he managed to stay on his feet. Been a bad boy, have you? Yes, Mistress Constance. Very bad, it would appear. How delightful. Her hungry eyes turned to Denna. I'm free. Let's go teach him what two more Sith can really do. 
No, not tonight, Constance. No? What do you mean, no? Dana exploded. I mean, no. He is my mate, and I'm taking him back to train him as such. Do you wish to come and watch when I lie with my mate? Do you want to watch, too, what I do when I have the Aegeal between my teeth? Richard shrank back. So that was what she had planned. If she did that to him tonight, as badly as he was already hurt. People in white robes, missionaries, Denna had called them, were staring. Constance glared back, and they hurried off. Both women's faces were red. Denna's from anger, Constance's from embarrassment. Of course not, Denna, she said in a low voice. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I will leave you to it. She gave Richard a smirk. You look to be in enough trouble already, my boy. I hope you're up to your duties. She gave him a jab in the stomach with her aegeal and walked off. Dizzy, Richard put his hand across himself with a moan. Denna's hand came up under his arm, holding him up. Denna glared after Constance, then started off, expecting him to follow. He did. When they were back in Denna's quarters, she gave him the bucket. He almost collapsed at the thought of filling her tub. Her voice was quiet. Go and get one bucket of hot water. Richard could have died with relief, knowing that he didn't have to fill the tub. He retrieved the water a little confused. She seemed to be angry, but wasn't directing her anger at him. He waited with his eyes cast downward after he set the bucket on the floor. Denna brought the chair over. He was surprised she didn't have him do it. Sit down. She went to the table by her bed and came back with a pear. She looked at it in her hand a moment, turning it around and around, rubbing it a little with her thumb, then held it out to him. I brought this back from dinner. I find I am no longer hungry. You had no dinner. You eat it. Richard looked at the pear in her hand as she held it toward him. No, Mistress Denna, it's yours, not mine. I know whose it is, Richard. Her voice was still quiet. Do as I say. He took the pear, eating it all, even the seeds. Denna knelt down and started washing him. He had no idea what was going on, but the washing hurt, although it was nothing to compare with the Aegeal. He wondered why she was doing this, when it was time to train him again. Denna seemed to sense his apprehension. I have a backache. I'm sorry, Mistress Denna, I've caused it by my behavior. Be quiet, she said gently. I want to sleep on something hard for my back. I will sleep on the floor. Since I will sleep on the floor, you will have to sleep in my bed, and I don't want your blood in it. Richard was a little perplexed. The floor was certainly big enough for the two of them, and she had certainly gotten his blood in her bed before. It had never bothered her in the past. He decided it was not his place to question, and so didn't. All right, she said when she had finished. Get in the bed. He lay down while she watched him. With resignation, he picked up the Aegeal from the side table and held it out to her, the pain from it hurting his arm. He wished she weren't going to do this to him tonight. Denna took the Aegeal from him and returned it to the table. Not tonight. I told you I have a backache. She blew out the lamp. Go to sleep. He heard her lie on the floor, whispering a curse to herself. He was too exhausted to think and was asleep in a short time. When the peal of the bell woke him, Denna was already up. She had cleaned the blood from her white outfit and had fixed her braid. She said nothing to him as they walked to the devotion. It was painful for him to kneel, and he was glad when it was finished. He didn't see Constance. Walking behind Denna, he began to turn toward the training room, but she didn't, and the chain pulled taut. The pain brought him up short. We're not going that way, she said. Yes, Mistress Denna. She walked a while, down halls that stretched forever, then gave him an impatient look. Walk next to me. We're going for a walk. It's something I enjoy doing occasionally, when my back hurts. It helps me. I'm sorry, Mistress Denna. I was hoping it would be better by this morning. She glanced at him, then looked back to where she was going. Well, it's not. So we will go for a walk. Richard had never been this far from Denna's quarters before. His eyes took little journeys to the new sights. At intervals, there were places just like the one where they went for their devotions, open to the sky and the sun, each with a rock in the center and a bell. Some had grass instead of sand, and some even a pool of water that the rock sat in. Fish glided in groups through the clear water. 
The halls were sometimes wide as rooms, with patterned tiles on the floor, arches and columns all about, ceilings soaring high above. Windows let light stream into these places, making them bright and airy. People were everywhere, most in robes of white or some other pale color. No one ever seemed in a hurry, but most seemed as if they had a place to go, although a few sat on marble benches. Richard saw a few soldiers. Most people walked past Denna and him as if they were invisible, but a few smiled and exchanged a greeting with her. The size of the place was astounding. The halls and passages stretched out of sight. Wide stairs led up or down to unknown parts of the great edifice. One hall had statues of naked people in proud poses. The statues were made of carved and polished stone, mostly white, some with gold veining through it, and each was twice as tall as he. Richard never saw one place that was dark or ugly or dirty. Everything he saw was beautiful. The sound of people's footsteps echoed through the halls like reverent whispers. Richard wondered how a place as large as this could even be conceived of, much less built. It must have taken lifetimes. Denna led them to a sprawling square that was open to the sky. Full-grown trees covered the mossy ground, and a path of brown clay tiles meandered through the center of the indoor forest. They strolled along the path, Richard looking up at the trees. They were beautiful, even if they were bare of leaves. Denna watched him. You like the trees, don't you? He nodded, looking about. Very much, Mistress Denna, he whispered. Why do you like them? Richard thought a moment. It seems they are part of my past. I can dimly recall that I was a guide. A woods guide, I think. But I don't remember much about it, Mistress Denna. Except I liked the woods. Being broken makes you forget things from before, she said quietly. The more I train you, the more you will forget the past. Except specific questions, I ask you. Soon you will remember none of it. Yes, Mr. Stenna. Mr. Stenna, what is this place? It's called the People's Palace. It's the seat of power in Dahara. It is the home of Master Ral. They had lunch in a different place than they usually ate. She had him sit in a chair. He didn't know why. They went to the afternoon devotion at one of the places with water instead of sand, and after devotion, they walked some more through the vast halls to find themselves back in familiar territory for dinner. The walking made him feel better. His muscles had needed to be stretched. After the evening devotion, in the little room in their quarters, Denna locked his arms behind his back in the binding device and hoisted it up, but not enough to take the weight off his feet. It still brought the pain back to his sore shoulders, but it made him wince only a little. Is your back better, Mistress Denna? Did the walking help? It's nothing I can't tolerate. She walked slowly around him, watching the floor. She stopped at last in front of him, rolling the Aegeal in her fingers for a time, scrutinizing it. Her eyes didn't come up. Her voice was hardly more than a whisper. Tell me you think I'm ugly. He looked at her until her eyes finally came up. No, that would be a lie. A sad smile spread on her lips. That was a mistake, my love. You have disobeyed my direct order, and you have forgotten the appellation. I know, Mistress Denna. Her eyes closed, but a little of the strength came back to her voice. You are nothing but trouble. I don't know why Master Rall burdened me with your training. You have earned yourself two hours. She gave him his two hours, not as hard as she usually did, but hard enough to make him cry in pain. After the training, she told him that her back still hurt, and slept on the floor again, having him sleep in the bed. The next few days went back to the regular routine, the training not being as long or as strenuous as before, except when Constance was there. Denna kept a close watch on her, guiding more than she had in the past. Constance didn't like it, sometimes glaring at Denna. When Constance was rougher than Denna wished, she wasn't invited for the next session. With the lighter training sessions, his head started to clear, and he began remembering things, things about his past. A few times, when Denna's back hurt, they went for long walks, looking at the various astonishingly beautiful places. After an afternoon devotion one day, Constance asked if she could come along. Denna smiled and said yes. Constance asked to do the training and was given permission. She was rougher than usual, 
and had Richard in prolonged agony, tears of pain streaming down his cheeks. Richard was hoping Denna would put a stop to it, as he was on his last strings of tolerance. As Denna came out of her chair, a man came into the room. Mistress Denna, Master Roll has requested you. When? Right now. Denna gave a sigh. Constance, would you finish the session? Constance looked into Richard's eyes and smiled. Why, of course, Denna. Richard was terrified, but didn't dare say a word. His time is nearly up. Just take him back to my quarters and leave him there. I'm sure I won't be long. My pleasure, Denna. You can count on me. Denna started to leave. Constance grinned at him wickedly, her face close to his. She grabbed his belt and yanked it open. Richard couldn't breathe. Constance, Denna had come back in. I don't want you doing that. Constance was caught off guard. In your absence, I'm in charge of him, and I'll do as I wish. Denna came and put her face close to the others. He is my mate, and I said I don't want you to do that. And I don't want you to put the Aegeal in his ear, either. I'll do as I... You will not. Denna gritted her teeth as she looked down to the shorter woman. I am the one who took the punishment when we killed Rostin. Me. Not you and me. Only me. I have never made a point of it before, but I do now. You know what they did to me, and I never told them you had a part in it. He is my mate, and I am his Mord Sith, not you, me. You will respect my wishes, or there is going to be trouble between us. All right, Denna, she huffed. All right. I'll mind your wishes. Denna still glared at her. See that you do, Sister Constance. Constance finished the session with all the effort she could bring forth, although she kept the Aegeal mostly where Denna wanted it. Richard knew it went on for longer than it should have. When she took him back to Denna's quarters, she spent a good hour slapping him around, then hooked the chain over the footboard of the bed and told him he was to stand until Denna came back. Constance put her face close to his, as best she could considering her height, and grabbed him between his legs. Take good care of this for me she sneered. You aren't going to have it much longer. I have reason to believe Master Ral will shortly be reassigning you to me, and when he does, I'm going to alter your anatomy. A grin spread on her face. And I don't think you're going to like it. His anger flashed, bringing on the pain of the magic. It took him to his knees. Constance laughed as she left the room. He managed to get the anger under control, but the pain wouldn't stop until he stood. Warm sunlight was streaming in the window. He hoped Denna would be returning soon. The sun set. Dinner time came and went. Still, Denna did not return. Richard began to worry. He had a feeling that something was wrong. He heard the peal of the bell for the evening devotion, but couldn't go to it, being chained to the bed. He wondered if he was supposed to kneel where he was, but realized he couldn't do that either. He had been told to stand. He thought maybe he should still chant the devotion but decided there was no one to hear him, and it wouldn't matter. It was long since dark out the window, but thankfully the lamps were lit, and at least he didn't have to stand in the dark. The two bells announced the end of evening devotion. Still, Denna was not back. His training time came and went. Still no Denna. Richard was fraught with worry. At last, he heard the door push open. Denna's head was bowed, her posture stiff. The braid was undone, and her hair disheveled. She laboriously pushed the door closed. He saw that her skin was ashen, her eyes wet. She didn't look at him. Richard, she said in a small voice, fill my bath for me, please. I need a bath. I feel very dirty right now. Of course, Mistress Denna. He dragged the tub in and ran as fast as he could to fill it. He didn't think he had ever done it more quickly. She stood and watched as he brought in bucket after bucket. When he was finished, he stood panting, waiting. Her trembling fingers started unbuttoning the leather. Help me with this. I don't think I can do it by myself. He unbuttoned it for her as she shivered. Wincing, he had to peel it off her back. Some of her skin came with it. His heart was pounding. Denna was covered with welts from the back of her neck to the back of her ankles. Richard was frightened and he ached with hurt for her, for the pain she was in. Tears came to his eyes. The power roared up in him. He ignored it. 
Mistress Denna, who did this to you? he demanded. Master Rall, it is nothing I did not deserve. He held her hands and helped her into the tub. She let out a little sound as she sank slowly into the hot water, sitting stiffly. Mistress Denna, why would he do this to you? She winced when he put the soapy cloth to her back. Constance told him I was being too easy on you. I deserve what was done to me. I have been lax in your training. I am Mord Sith. I should have done better. I received only that which I deserve. You do not deserve this, Mistress Denna. It is me who should have taken the punishment, not you. Her hands trembled as she held the sides of the tub, and he carefully washed her. He gently wiped the sweat off the white skin of her face. She stared ahead the whole time he worked, a few tears rolling down her cheeks. Her lip quivered. Tomorrow, Master Rall will see you. His hand stopped washing for a second. I'm sorry, Richard. You will answer his questions. He glanced up at her face, but she didn't look back. Yes, Mistress Denna. He rinsed her off with water cupped in his hands. Let me dry you off. He did it as gently as he could. Do you wish to sit, Mistress Denna? She gave an embarrassed smile. I don't think I would like that just now. She turned her head stiffly. Over there, I will lie on the bed. She took his hand when he put it out for her. I can't seem to stop shaking. Why can't I stop shaking? Because it hurts, Mistress Denna. I've had much worse than this done to me. This was only a small reminder of who I am. But still, I can't stop shaking. She lay face down on the bed, her eyes on him. Richard's worry made his mind start working again. Mistress Denna, is my pack still here? In the cabinet, why? Just lie still, Mistress Denna. Let me do something, if I can remember how. He pulled his pack from a high shelf in the cabinet, laid it on the table, and started rummaging through it. Denna watched him, the side of her face resting on the backs of her hands. Beneath a carved bone whistle on a leather thong, he found the package he was searching for and laid it open on the table. He pulled out a tin bowl, took his knife from his belt, and laid it, too, on the table. He stood and took a jar of cream from the cabinet. He had seen her spread it on her skin. It was just what he needed. Mistress Denna, may I use this? Why? Please? Go ahead. Richard took the entire pile of neatly stacked, dried alm leaves and put them in the tin bowl, then selected a few other herbs he remembered by smell, but not by name, and dumped them in with the alm leaves. With the knife handle, he ground it all into a powder, Picking up the jar of cream, he scooped it all out and plopped it in the bowl and mixed it with two fingers. He took the bowl and sat on the bed next to her. Just lie still, he told her. The appellation, Richard. The appellation. Will you never learn? Sorry, Mistress Denna, he smiled. You may punish me later, for now lie still. When I'm finished, you will feel well enough to punish me all night, I promise. He spread the paste gently on the welts, smoothing it out as he went. Denna moaned. Her eyes closed while he worked. By the time he reached the back of her ankles, she was almost asleep. He stroked her hair while the alm cream soaked in. How does that feel, Mistress Denna? he whispered. She rolled onto her side. Her eyes came open wide. The pain is gone. How did you do that? How did you make the pain leave? Richard smiled in satisfaction. I learned it from an old friend named... He frowned. I can't remember his name, but he's an old friend, and he taught me. I'm so relieved, Mistress Stenna. I don't like to see you in pain. She gently touched her fingers to the side of his face. You are a very rare person, Richard Cipher. I have never had a mate like you before. The spirits take me. I've never even seen a person like you before. I killed the one who did the things to me that I have done to you, and you instead helped me. We all can be only who we are, no more and no less, Mistress Denna. He looked down at his hands. I don't like what Master Rawl has done to you. You don't understand about the Mord Sith, my love. We are carefully selected as young girls. Those chosen to be Mord Sith are the most gentle, the most kind-hearted that can be found. It is said that the deepest cruelty comes from the deepest caring. All of Dahara is searched, and each year only about a half-dozen are chosen. A moored Sith is broken three times. 
His eyes were wide. Three times, he whispered. Denna nodded. The first is the way in which I broke you, to break the spirit. The second is to break our empathy. To do it, we must watch our trainer break our mother and make her his pet, and watch him hurt her until she dies. The third is to break us of our fear of hurting another, to make us enjoy giving pain. To do it, we must break our fathers under the guidance of our trainer and make him our pet and keep hurting him until we kill him. Tears trickled down Richard's cheeks. They did all this to you? What I did to you to break you is nothing compared to what must be done to us to break us the second and third time. The more kind-hearted a girl is, the better moored Sith she makes, but it makes it harder to break her the second and third time. Master Rahl thinks me special because they had a very difficult time with the second breaking of me. My mother lived a long time to try to keep me from giving up hope, but that only made it harder on both of us. They failed at the third breaking, had given up and were going to kill me, but Master Rahl said that if I could be broken, I would be someone special, and so took over my training himself. He is the one who broke me the third time. On the day I killed my father, he took me to his bed as a reward. His reward left me barren. Richard could hardly speak past the lump in his throat. With shaking fingers, he brushed some of her hair back off her face. I don't want anyone hurting you, not ever again, Mistress Denna. It is an honor, Denna whispered through tears, that Master Rall would spare the time to punish one as low as me with my own Aegeel. Richard sat numb. I hope he kills me tomorrow so I don't have to learn anything else that gives me this much pain, Mistress Denna. Her wet eyes shone in the lamplight. I have done things to hurt you that I have done to no other, yet you are the first person since I was chosen who has done anything to stop my pain. She sat up, picked up the tin bowl. There is some left. Let me put it on you where Constance did what I told her not to. Denna spread the alm cream on the welts on his shoulders, then on his stomach and chest, working up to his neck. Her eyes met his. Her hand stopped. The room was dead quiet. Denna leaned forward and gently kissed him. She put her hand with the cream on the back of his neck and kissed him again. She lay back on the bed, holding his hand against her belly with both of hers. Come to me, my love. I want you very badly right now. He nodded and started to reach for the Aegeal on the side table. Denna touched his wrist. Tonight I want you without the Aegeal. Please, teach me what it's like without the pain. She put a hand behind his neck and gently pulled him on top of her. Chapter 43 Denna didn't train him the next morning, but instead took him for a walk. Master Rahl had said he wanted to see Richard after the second devotion. After it was over and they were starting to leave, Constance stopped them. You look surprisingly well today, Sister Denna. Denna looked at her without emotion. Richard was furious at Constance for talking to Master Rahl about Denna for getting her punished and had to concentrate on Denna's braid. Constance turned to Richard. Well, I hear you are to be granted an audience with Master Rahl today. If you are still alive afterward, you will be seeing more of me, alone. I want a piece of you, as it were, when he's finished with you. He spoke before he thought. The year they chose you, Mistress Constance, must have been a year of desperate need. Otherwise, one of such limited intelligence would never have been selected to be Mord Sith. Only the most ignorant would put their own petty ambitions above the value of a friend, especially a friend who has sacrificed much for you. You are not worthy to kiss Mistress Denna's Aegeel. Richard smiled smoothly, confidently, as she stood startled. You had better hope Master Rawl kills me, Mistress Constance, because if he doesn't, then the next time I see you, I'm going to kill you for what you've done to Mistress Denna. Constance stared in shock, then suddenly drove her Aegeel toward him. Denna's longer arm came up. She slammed her own Aegeel against Constance's throat, holding her back. Constance's eyes bulged in surprise. She coughed blood and dropped to her knees, clutching her hands to her throat. Denna stared down at her a moment before starting off without a word. Richard followed, attached by the chain. He sped up to walk beside her. Denna kept her eyes ahead, showing no emotion. Just try and guess how many hours that has earned you, Richard smiled. 
Mistress Denna, if there is a moored Sith who could raise a scream from a dead man, it would be you. And if Master Roll doesn't kill you, how many hours? Mistress Denna, there are not enough hours in a lifetime to dim my pleasure at what I have done. She smiled a little, but didn't look over. I'm glad, then, that it was worth it for you. She gave him a sidelong glance. I still don't understand you. As you said, we can be no more or less than who we are. I regret I can be no more than I am, and I fear you can be no less. Were we not warriors fighting on opposite sides in this war, I would keep you as a mate for life and work to see you die of old age. Richard was warmed by her gentle tone. I would try my best to live a long life for you, Mistress Denna. They walked on through the halls, past the devotion squares, past the statues, past the people. She took him upstairs, through vast rooms of exquisite decorations. She stopped in front of a pair of doors covered in carvings of rolling hills and forests, all sheathed in gold. Denna turned to him. Are you prepared to die this day, my love? The day is not over yet, Mistress Denna. She slipped her arms around his neck, kissing him tenderly. She pulled her face away a few inches, stroked the back of his head. I'm sorry, Richard, that I do these things to you, but I have been trained to do them and can do nothing less. I live only to hurt you. Know that it is not by choice, but by training. I can be no more than what I am, Mord Sith. If you are to die this day, my love, then make me proud and die well. He was mate to a madwoman, he thought sadly, and one not of her own making. She pushed the doors open and entered a grand garden. Richard would have been impressed had his mind not been on other things. They went down a path between flowers and shrubs, past short vine-covered stone walls and small trees to an expanse of lawn. A glass roof led in the light, keeping the plants healthy and in flower. In the distance were two identically huge men, their folded arms had metal bands with sharp projections just above their elbows. Guards of some sort, Richard thought. To their side stood another man. Imposing muscles flexed on his smooth chest. His short cropped blonde hair stood up in spikes with a single black streak running through it. Near the center of the lawn, near a circle of white sand in a warm shaft of late afternoon sunlight stood a man with his back to them. The sunlight made his white robes and shoulder-length blonde hair glow. Sparks of the sunlight glinted off the gold belt and curved dagger at his waist. As Richard and Denna approached him, Denna dropped to her knees, putting her forehead to the ground. Richard had been instructed and did the same as he pushed his sword out of the way. Together they chanted, Master Rall, guide us. Master Rall, teach us. Master Rall, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. They chanted only once, then waited, Richard trembling slightly. He remembered that he was never to get near Master Rall, to stay away from him, but couldn't remember who told him so, only that it was important. He had to concentrate on Denna's braid to control the anger at what Master Rall had done to her. Rise, my children. Richard stood with his shoulder close against Mistress Denna while intense blue eyes studied him. That the Master's face looked kind, intelligent, pleasant, did not calm Richard's churning fears and the thoughts that boiled just below the surface of his mind. The blue eyes glided to Denna. You look surprisingly well this morning, my pet. Mistress Denna is as good at taking pain as giving it, Master Rall, Richard heard himself say. The blue eyes returned to his. The calmness, the peace in Rall's face made Richard quiver. My pet has told me you are nothing but trouble. I am pleased to see she has not lied to me, but not pleased to find it true. He clasped his hands in a relaxed manner. Well, no matter. How good to meet you at last, Richard Cipher. Denna drove the Aegeal into his back with a sharp jab to remind him of what it was he was supposed to say. It is my honor to be here, Master Rall. I live only to serve. I am humbled in your presence. A small smile came to Rall's lips. Yes, I am sure you are. He studied Richard's face for an uncomfortable moment. I have some questions. You are going to give me the answers. Richard felt himself shaking slightly. Yes, Master Rall. Kneel, he said softly. 
Richard went to his knees with the aid of the Aegeal on his shoulder. Denna stepped behind and put a boot to each side of him. She pressed her thighs against his shoulders, bracing against them for leverage, as she held his hair in her fist. She pulled his head back a little, making him look up into the master's blue eyes. Richard swallowed in terror. Dark and Rawl looked down without emotion. You have seen the Book of Counted Shadows before. Something powerful in the back of his mind told Richard he shouldn't answer. When he said nothing, Denna tightened her grip on his hair and pushed the Aegeal against the base of his skull. There was a stunning explosion of pain in his head. Denna's grip on his hair was all that kept him upright. It was as if she had compressed the pain of an entire training session into that one touch. He couldn't move, breathe, or even cry out. He was beyond being in pain. The shock took everything from him, and in its place left an all-consuming agony of fire and ice. She took away the Aegeal. He didn't know where he was, who he was, who was holding him, only that this was more pain than he had ever known before, and that there was a man in front of him dressed in a white robe. Blue eyes looked down at him. You have seen the Book of Counted Shadows before? Yes, he heard himself say. Where is it now? Richard hesitated. He didn't know how to answer. He didn't know what the voice wanted. The pain exploded in his head again. When it stopped, he felt tears running down his cheeks. Where is it now? The voice repeated. Please don't hurt me any more, he cried. I don't understand the question. What is there not to understand? Simply tell me where the book is now. The book or the knowledge of the book? Richard asked fearfully. The blue eyes frowned. The book. I burned it in a fire years ago. Richard thought the eyes were going to tear him apart. And where is the knowledge? Richard hesitated too long. When he was aware again, Denna yanked his head up to look into the blue eyes again. Richard had never felt so alone, so helpless, so afraid. Where is the knowledge that was in the book? In my head. Before I burned the book, I learned the words, the knowledge. The man stood staring, unmoving. Richard cried softly. Recite the words of the book. Richard desperately didn't want the Aegeal in the back of his head again. He shook with the fear of it. Verification of the truth of the words of the book of counted shadows if spoken by another rather than read by the one who commands the boxes can only be ensured by the use of a confessor. Confessor. Kalin. The name Kalin went through Richard's mind like a bolt of lightning. The power roared to life, blasting away the fog with the burning white-hot glare of his memories. The door to the locked room in his mind was flung open. It all came back to him, brought back by the power as it rose in him. Richard was one with the power, at the thought of Dark and Rawl having Kalin, hurting her. Dark and Rawl turned to the other men. The one with the black stripe came forward. You see, my friend, the fates work for me. She is already on her way here with the old one. Find her. See to it she is brought to me. Take two quads, but I want her alive. Do you understand? The man gave a nod. You and your men will have the protection of my spell. The old one is with her, but he will have no weapon against an underworld spell, if he is even alive by then. Rawl's voice became harder. And Damon, I don't care what your men do to her, but she had better be alive when she gets here and able to use her power. A little of the color left the man's face. I understand. It will be done as you wish, Lord Rawl. He bowed deep. He turned and left after meeting Richard's eyes and giving a knowing smile. Dark and Rawl returned his blue eyes to Richard. Continue. Richard had gone as far as he was going to go. He remembered everything. It was time to die. I will not. There is nothing you can do to make me tell you. I welcome the pain. I welcome death. Before the Aegeal could come, Rawl's eyes snapped up to Denna. Richard felt her fist loosen on his hair. One of the guards marched forward, grabbed her by the throat with his big hand, squeezing, until Richard could hear her struggling to breathe. Rawl glared at her. You told me he was broken. He was, Master Rawl. 
She struggled to speak as she was being choked. I swear. I am very disappointed in you, Dana. As the man lifted her feet off the ground, Richard could hear her sounds of pain. Again, the power turned white hot in him. Dena was being hurt. Before anyone knew what was happening, he was on his feet, the power of the magic raging through him. Richard threw one arm around the man's thick neck, grasping his opposite shoulder. He grabbed the man's head with his other arm and in a blink gave a powerful twist. The man's neck snapped. He went down in a heap. Richard spun. The other guard was almost on him, his hand reaching out. Richard seized the man's wrist and used his advancing weight to pull his adversary into the knife. He drove it up to his fist and gave it a mighty pull, cutting all the way up to the man's heart as his blue eyes went wide in surprise. His insides spilled across the ground when he hit. Richard stood panting with the power. Everything in his peripheral vision was white, white from the heat of the magic. Denna had her hands to her throat, clutching at the pain. Dark and Rawl stood calmly, licking the tips of his fingers as he watched Richard. Denna brought on the pain of the magic enough to take Richard to his knees. He folded his arms across his gut. Master Rawl, Denna gasped. Let me take him back for the night. I swear that in the morning he will answer anything you ask him, if he's still alive. Allow me to redeem myself. No. Rawl said, deep in thought, waving his hand a little. I apologize, my pet. This is not your failing. I had no idea what we were dealing with. Turn off the pain in him. Richard recovered and returned to his feet. The fog had cleared from his head. He felt as if he were waking from a dream only to find himself in a nightmare. The rest of him was out of the little locked room in his mind, and he wasn't putting it away again. He would die with all of his mind, his dignity, intact. He kept the anger choked off, but there was fire in his eyes, fire in his heart. Did the old one teach you that? Rawl asked, a curious frown on his face. Teach me what? To partition your mind. That was how you kept from being broken. I don't know what you're talking about. You put up a partition to protect the core, sacrifice the rest to what would be done. A moored Sith cannot break a partitioned mind. Punish, yes. Break, no. He turned to Denna. Once again, I am sorry, my pet. I thought you had failed me. You have not. None but the most talented could have taken him this far. You have done well, but this makes matters altogether different. He smiled licked his fingertips, smoothed them over his eyebrows. Richard and I are going to have a private conversation now. While he is in this room with me, I wish you to let him speak without the pain of the magic. It interferes with what I may need to do. While he is here, he is to be free of your control. You may return to your quarters. When I am done with him, and if he is still alive, I will send him back to you as promised. Denna bowed deeply. I live to serve Master Rahl. She turned to Richard, her face crimson, and put a finger under his chin, lifting it a little. Don't disappoint me, my love. The seeker smiled. Never, Mistress Denna. He let the anger rage just to feel it again as he watched her walk away. Rage at her and at what had been done to her. Don't think of the problem, he told himself. Think of the solution. Richard turned to face Dark and Rahl. The other's face was calm showed nothing. Richard made his do the same. You know I want to know what the rest of the book says. Kill me. Rawl smiled. So eager to die, are we? Yes, kill me. Just like you killed my father. Dark and Rawl frowned, the smile still on his lips. Your father? I have not killed your father, Richard. George Cipher, you killed him. Don't try to deny it. You killed him with that knife at your belt. Rawl spread his hands in mock innocence. Oh, I don't deny killing George Cipher, but I have not killed your father. Richard stood caught off guard. What are you talking about? Dark and Rawl strolled around him, watching his eyes as Richard tried to follow him by turning his head. It's quite good. It really is. The best I have ever seen. Done by the Great One himself. What? Dark and Rawl licked his fingers and stopped in front of him. The wizard's web around you. I've never seen one like it. 
It's wound around you tight as a cocoon. Been there a good long time. It's quite intricate. I don't think even I could untangle it. If you are trying to convince me George Cipher is not my father, you have failed. If you are trying to convince me you are mad, you needn't bother. That much I already know. My dear boy, Raoul laughed, I couldn't care less who you believe your father to be. Nonetheless, there is a wizard's web hiding the truth from you. Really? I'll play along. Who's my father, if it's not George Cipher? I wouldn't know, Raoul shrugged. The web hides it. But from what I've seen, I have my suspicions. The smile left. What does the Book of Counted Shadows say? Richard shrugged. That's your question? You disappoint me. How so? Well, after what was done to your bastard father, I thought sure you'd want to know the old wizard's name. Dark and Rawl glared as he slowly licked his fingertips. What is the old wizard's name? It was Richard's turn to smile. He spread his arms wide. Cut me open. It's written on my guts. You will have to find it there. Richard kept the smirk on his face. He knew he was defenseless and was hoping Rawl would be driven to kill him. If he was dead, the book died with him. No box, no book. Rawl was going to die. Kalin would be safe then. That was all that mattered. In one week it will be the first day of winter, and I will know the name of the wizard and have the power to snatch him from wherever he is and bring his hide to me. In one week you will be dead. You have only two boxes. Dark and Rawl licked his fingers again and smoothed them over his lips. I have two right now, and the third is on its way here as we speak. Richard tried not to believe him, let his face show nothing. A brave boast, but a lie nonetheless. In one week, you are going to die. Rawl raised his eyebrows. I speak the truth. You have been betrayed. The same one who has betrayed you to me has also betrayed the box to me. It will be here in a few days. I don't believe you. Richard said flatly. Dark and Rawl licked his fingertips and turned, walking around the circle of white sand. No? Let me show you something. Richard followed him to a wedge of white stone upon which sat a flat slab of granite held up by two short fluted pedestals. In the center of the slab sat two of the boxes of Orden. One was ornately jeweled like the one Richard had seen before. The other was as black as the night stone, its surface a void in the light of the room. The box itself, its protective covering, removed. Two of the boxes of Orden, Rawl announced, holding his hand out to them. Why would I want the book? The book would be useless to me without the third box. You had the third box. The one who betrayed you told me so. If the box were not on its way, why would I need the book? I would instead cut you open to get the location of the box. Richard shook with anger. Who betrayed me in the box? Tell me the name. Or what? Or you will cut me open and read the name on my guts? I will not betray the name of one who has helped me. You are not the only one with honor. <laughs>